it works. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, let me make sure I've got everything ready. Um, looking around. Wow, we have quite a few celebrities. Uh, good to see you all again. Uh, let me go ahead and get us started. Uh, we've got quite a bit to talk about today, but um, I'm going to probably end up um, running out of time. So let's talk. Let, let's go ahead and get started. So uh, anyway, I'm going to go up here to my slideshow. You all can see this from the beginning. Uh, and this is where we are right now. So we are at the Greater San Diego Association of Realtors. And uh, my name is Kevin Burke. And there's my telephone number. There's my email address. Happy to chat with you. Rather speak with you in person. But but if uh, if need be, send me an email. It's uh, certainly uh, any time is a good time. Um, and I should say I am not actually at the Greater San Diego Association of Realtors. I am in Sacramento at the California uh, Real Estate, California Association of Realtors uh, legislative meeting. And so y'all, you know, I, I've had a lot of conversations with people while I'm up here. Um, you know, I really think that everything I know about real estate, I learned by coming to these meetings. It is just, you, you can't learn this much. It's just a condensed, it's like an IV, uh, drip, uh, solution of learning actually real estate, which is what I think we're all here to do. So, um, if you haven't done it before, you need to put it on your calendar. Uh, definitely want to be, uh, um, attending these events because these are just the, the the blockbuster. I just walked out of the professional standards meeting to get to this webinar. Um, later on today, I'll, I'll be doing uh, our webinar. Well, we'll talk about that in a second. Tomorrow's risk management, you know, those kinds of things. So we do a lot of really good stuff. And, and again, sometimes it requires a little bit of travel, but I think you really should be involved in your in in what you do for a business. So anyway, enough of that, me proselytizing about that. Um, here are some credentials, uh, again, that uh, perhaps make me qualified to talk about the subject matter today. Um, and, and I hate to say that, that there's going to be a lot of legal overlap today, but uh, I have 40 plus years in real estate. I put that plus sign rather than ticking it up every year. Um, I did. Uh, I do teach continuing education for attorneys uh, at uh, UCSD, um, and obviously I've, I've taught legal aspects of real estate, among other things, at the various college levels. I am also uh, very involved in risk management. Uh, as you can tell from the promo here. And so that's enough about that. We're going to be talking about things that are going to appear to be legal. I am not a practicing attorney. Um, in fact, you're not even seeing this on, you're seeing it on the computer's video, which is okay. Interesting, because it's not on the, the, the Zoom. Well, all right. Okay. Everybody can still see me. Okay. If anybody can't see me, will you let me know? Um, so anyway, my admonition is always that I am not a practicing attorney. Uh, hey, McKay, uh, not a practicing attorney, have no interest whatsoever. Listen, you know, they work a heck of a lot harder than you and I do, folks. I just want you to know that. Uh, but, uh, you know, good people uh, nonetheless. So um, again, uh, my, I do a lot of trial work, uh, testifying as an expert witness, uh, mostly standard of care for real estate agents, mostly in defensive brokerages, um, agents duties of inspection and disclosure and market conditions in San Diego County. Uh, I got my first pop up here. Uh, what makes you think I... <laughs> So I'm being asked, what makes you think people actually want to see your face? And I, I don't know, right? So uh, anyway, that's kind of cute. Thanks, McKay. Um, but uh, so I, I didn't realize I hooked up the the camera that I have, the Logitech, but the camera on my computer is actually as good or better. So it's it's pretty good. So anyway, conversation today, not intended to be a substitute for the advice of your broker, nor for that of your attorney. Please consult with them as appropriate. You're paying them to be there. They want to hear from you. I know that when I'm working with brokerage firms, it's usually the quiet one that <laughs> becomes a little bit more of a problem. So we want to hear from you. Okay, everybody, Pamela, everybody, I want to hear from you. Okay. All right. So our webinars are intended to be interactive. Please utilize the Q&A button. Okay. And so uh, to ask questions or offer input, I do look forward to hearing from you. I do. I like, I, I, I get engaged. Um, I walked into that professional standards uh, meeting this morning. I'd had a, 
a call earlier today from a broker that was having some challenges in a certain um, uh, thing. And, you know, it's just so interesting. He talked about, you know, being in, in with the who, you know, here I am and, and, and walk right by me, another uh, uh, agent that I had referred um, for expert witness testimony on the subject matter that I was being asked about earlier in the morning. And so I said, you know, here's my scenario. They said, okay, good. Yeah, here's what we would do. I said, good. That's what I said to do. Um, and so I got back to the broker that was having the challenges. And I said, you know, a whole bunch of us have talked about this. Uh, and at the end of the day, and so this is why I'm telling you, these are good places to be if you can if you can handle that part. I know that right now it's a little late for you to get up here to Sacramento, but we're going to be uh, uh, the next meeting is going to be in Anaheim. So a little bit closer. I recommend you put it on your calendar. It'll also be Expo. So it'll be a lot of really cool stuff uh, happening there. OK. All right. Um, so today. My award winning. Yes, McKay, my award winning presentation on how to read a preliminary title report. OK, so again, I gave myself the award because I thought this is really cool. I really love this this uh, webinar that we're going to do. It's going to be from today from 10 to 12. Um, if I ever get around to it this afternoon from two to four, we're going to be doing top 10 risk avoidance techniques. Um, we used to call it lawsuit avoidance, but, you know, you, you know, sometimes it's just your ticket is up. So uh, it just is what it is. But I want to try to, you know, my goal is to keep you out of trouble if that's at all possible. Um, Thursday. Now, I want to make a note. This is Thursday the 11th, so we will not be having any presentations this coming Thursday the 4th, right? And so, uh, and, and so again, please note the time change. Nothing until Thursday the 11th, all right? And then at that time, we will be doing in the morning, we will be doing uh, 2023 changes to the residential purchase agreement, certainly one of my favorite subjects. Um, by the way, we have done some soft publishes, we call them. Those are changes that we made to the, um, to the agreement that that, you know, we didn't tell you about, right? So, you know, once we had uh, changed it, then we realized there were a couple of typos, a couple of mistakes. And so we made some other changes. So I'll try to bring those out as well. But, um, you know, we'll have two hours to talk about it. We should be pretty good. Um, we're we're going to be, uh, um, and again, I've sent up to the Department of Real Estate uh, a class for review on the on the full RPA, but that's a five hour class. So, you know, so that uh, obviously I'm not uh, just here to kill time, um, but but there's a lot of material to discuss. And then and then, of course, after the whoops, after that, we've got um, the buyer representation and broker compensation agreement, and that will run from two to four. So that will be Thursday, the 11th. So we'll have one more session today that will be this one currently, plus we'll have the top 10 risk avoidance techniques and then Thursday of the following week. And the reason behind all that is that we are at the CAR meetings currently, but then but then next week, I'm, I'm at literally getting on an airplane Thursday, this Thursday night at 11 o'clock, flying to D.C., uh, where I'll be at the NAR meetings all of next week. And so, uh, but Thursday, we'll have a couple of presentations. Uh, Tuesday, just can't possibly do it. It's a very busy day. And, and again, I'm on risk management there at the national level. So, okay, that being said, member benefits, we're going to be talking today about the agent toolbox, how to read a preliminary title report. Um, so a couple of admonitions really quick here. Uh, again, I'm excited to do this because it's a lot of fun, but, but this webinar is not intended to make you a legal professional. I just thought I would say that because you know, I get people, you know, I'll say something in a webinar and then the next, and I, and I always tell you, I'm not giving you legal advice. And then, and then I'll hear somebody say, well, you know, I talked to somebody who said that you said, and it's like, well, at least they're quoting the source, right? But uh, you are not a legal professional at the end of this. Um, uh, some of you actually are legal professionals on this webinar already, um, but uh, I'm not going to call you out by name. So nor is it intended to be an exhaustive dis uh, dissertation on all of the issues, but we're going to kill the prelim. Okay. It's going to be, you're, you're going to love the prelim one, you know, by the time I'm done here today. So the stuff that we're going to find in the report. So it is intended to help you understand your potential obligations. And, and this is, of course, this is where all the trial stuff comes from, right? You know, did you meet your obligation? Um, and red flag issues, uh, red flags associated with the prelim. Okay, so um, remember, very importantly, remember that a preliminary title report. You know, so you all know when you when you get involved in a real estate transaction, um, you normally you want to get the title report ordered as soon as possible, right? Because it's going to contain a lot of good stuff, and I'm going to show you why that date is so very important. But um, but but in a real estate, and, and again, remember there's no law that requires title insurance in the state of California. Okay. And I tell people that they go, oh, wait a minute. Yes, there is. The answer is no, there isn't. 
the law requires automobile insurance, but it doesn't require title insurance. And so I remember the court holdings on, you know, the, the people that don't get title insurance, right? So, you know, people that are paying cash, you know, things like that. And they go, oh, I don't need title insurance. Um, I had a, I had a case brother, a uh, half brother against half brother, where the half brother bought uh, the, the, half, the other brother's interest to, in, a, in a piece of land and then, uh, and did not get title insurance because they figured, oh, it's my half brother. The next thing you know, there's this IRS tax lien, which is a general lien, which attached to the property. And so the property was essentially worthless. So is title insurance a good idea? The courts say so. It's not only is it a good idea, it's it's easy to obtain. Um, it's very common. Everybody does it. It's good business model. And it's pretty it's pretty inexpensive. Really, if you think about the process in California, we, we get title insurance rather than having attorneys create um, uh, abs opinions of title in other states where I'm licensed. You know, the attorneys are involved and they do opinions of title, things like that. And so when they make a mistake, you go after the attorney for uh, under their malpractice insurance. But in, in, in California, we do title insurance and, and therefore you go after the title company that issued the report. Um, and we're going to see sometimes that may be successful, sometimes not. I can tell you personally, I, in, in all of the years that I've been uh, in real estate, 40 plus years, I've had one claim against uh, title and it was a transaction that I was involved in back in 1984, so literally a good uh, 40 years ago now. Um, and it was uh, there was an unrecorded second um, title got involved in it. I represented the buyer, and then turned out the seller had an unrecorded second. And and uh, title said, you know, we'll take care of it. And they literally bought the property back because of some uh, things that they had done in the transaction. It was actually cheaper for them to buy the property than it was to uh, suffer the lawsuit. So you know, but that's the only. Claim Claim I've ever seen. I wasn't involved in it. They took me out of it right away. They said, we don't need you. Um, and I always love it. You know, when the client says, well, we don't need you this. We're okay. All right. So, um, but I want you to know that it is otherwise known, aka also known as a prelim or a PR. So you'll hear prelim, PR. We're going to use the, you know, I'm not going to go, you know, but I'm going to use all these terms here today. Okay. All right. So um, remember that the preliminary title report is not a policy of title insurance. Okay. It is preliminary to the issuance of a policy of title insurance. So essentially, you can't sue on it, right? So um, the, the law, I mean, essentially, you shouldn't be able to. I mean, I guess there's a possibility, but you know, most times, uh, if, there is a, if there is a suit, uh, it's going to have to go after the policy itself, okay? So uh, um, the policy of title, the actual policy of title insurance arrives approximately 30 days after settlement. You might call it close of escrow. Different jurisdictions call it different things. COE, um, I remember having a, a, a trial at one point where the judge asked me to, to tell it tell them what the, what COE stood for. And of course, I said circle of excellence, and, and they didn't think that was very funny. So, um, but anyway, it's close of escrow. Okay, I get it. You know, that's not called that in other places, but settlement, you know, when title transfers from the seller to the buyer, that's what we're talking about. Okay. So what happens? The title plant prepares the report. And we're going to call it the plan. Okay. We're going to see references to this later. Um, the uh as it locks up, what's going on here? Boom, boom. Uh, then the TO, the title officer, signs off on it. So the title officer is the is essentially the insuring part of the title company that says, okay, this is good to go. Um, and then it is sent to the escrow officer. And we're going to see this chain uh, when we when we pull out an actual uh, uh, sample report. And I'm going to go through the whole report with you. So um, it is then sent to the escrow officer. So um, that being said, I need to make sure I keep my uh, clock here uh, going so that, uh, oh shoot, uh, where's my clock? Sorry, folks. Because um, I need to make sure that I don't um, go past my time period. <laughs> so anyway, save it. Uh, so it's going to go off in an hour. Okay, so uh, they then send it to the escrow officer who then transmits it to the parties. And I say the parties, not just the buyer, right? Because this is important to the seller as well. Um, and I've seen many a time where the seller was not aware of things that were contained uh, as a matter of record. Um, and, and boy, we're, we're moving really fast, but we don't want to delay giving this. Now, here's the problem. They're, they're going to send it to the to you, the agents, the licensees, and then they're also going to send it to the parties. Folks, the worst thing you can do at this point is ignore it. Uh, the worst thing you can do is say to the buyer, you know, give me a call if you have any questions. You know, you, you, we're going to talk about some really 
ugly situations here. Okay, so so anyway, they're going to transmit it to the parties. Why? Um, because the receipt that they send, remember, it is time stamped. So if you remember your purchase agreement, your purchase agreement gives the buyer five days to review the policy. The most of our agreements say seventeen, but it's five days essentially after receipt. Okay, and we're going to talk about a court case where the buyer. Uh, settled on the on the transaction and never received it. So, um, but that's a big case, and it's it's one you're going to want to keep near and dear to your heart. And McKay, you especially want to keep an eye on it. So, what was that case? Field versus Century Twenty One Cloud and Furness. And Cloud and Furness was a good company. Um, you know, Jack and and the whole group. You know, good people. Okay. Uh, now, things just did not go the way they were supposed to go. And this is this court case is back in 1998. Okay. So, and it was a California court of appeals case. So it started at the lower court. Um, the, the brokerage lost at the lower court. Um, and then unfortunately the California court of appeals affirmed. Um, and so uh, let's take a look at that case. Uh, and so, you know, we're not going to, like I said, you know, I'm going to show you the case. We're not going to get, you know, really too crazy about getting into case law and all that, but, but uh, I do want to uh, make you aware of this. Now I've highlighted some things in this case, and this is again, uh, you know, a, a reprinted version of it, but you can see the chain of events up here at the top. And it is the California, the court of appeal, the fourth district. Okay. So, and notice the date in here. So it's field versus Century Twenty One Cloud and Furness Realty. And by the way, they're out. They don't. They don't work anymore. They're not there anymore. And I think it's sad. But but it, but it is. It's just the way things went down. And and you're going to find that when you read this case, that it really is not a case against the real estate agent. It's really more, uh, unfortunately, the dicta, which is the language that the judges use in their opinion, was very. Uh, bad, bad for the for our community uh, in general, but it was really a statute of limitations case. Okay, and so, um, but if you ask any self-respecting attorney out there, they're going to go, and, and I can say this because I don't practice law, but I think bad case. Okay, um, uh, I think it could have been tweaked a little bit differently, but but you know it is what it is. It made it up to the appellate court by the folks. By the time you get to the appellate court. There's a lot of money been spent. Okay, um, to t kick it up another notch to the Supreme Court is going to uh, that's going to be very, very, very expensive. If you didn't think you'd already spent a lot of money, now it's really good. Well, I note made a note in here that it has been certified for partial publication, which means it is the law of the land at this point. Okay, so so again, two year statute of limitations, um, and I, I've highlighted the and I will send all this to you. So you know, if any of you want copies of my file, I have the whole file I'll send to you. But it's a it's a two year statute. Of limitations case based on civil code 2079. And you and I know that 2079 is us, right? So 2079 came out of the Easton case, which I'm going to show you also in a second. Um, I didn't highlight that one because it's not that important for, for our purposes. But 20, civil code 2079 was a codification of the results of the Easton case. And so they essentially, they sat down and they said, okay, here's what the court said in Easton. Uh, and so we're going to just put it, make it a, a law. And and wow, 2079 came out of that. And, and so, as you know, your California Association of Realtors uh, recently changed, or, um, what do we do? We changed some of the terms in, in the law and, and redefined it a bit. So it's not the same thing that it was back when it was created in, in uh in 1978, okay, but 2079 is a big deal, okay, it really is. Uh, and again, I get a lot of casework on that. So, uh, um, so, uh, but it, but the court says it doesn't apply to claims for breach of fiduciary duty um, brought uh, against the real estate brokers by the buyer. Okay, so uh, then I get in. It's a purchase of a residential property. Some of you heard me talk about this case before. I think it's just an amazing case. Came out of Otay Mesa, by the way. So, um, so, uh, and again, I've always said the best lawsuits are come out of Southern California. So, for the following reasons, we conclude by the buyers. Uh, actions by the buyers against the brokers um, are not limited by the two-year time bar of 2079. Again, I said it's a statute of limitations case. So in other words, you know, it, it, it's limited, which limited claims for breaches of duty, uh, you know, for, for that. Okay. So, um, but sellers, brokers are the part, are, are, are the, are the concern, the fiduciary duty of a broker, uh, independent of, of a separate obligation imposed by on a seller's broker to conduct a 
reasonable visual inspection of the marketed property. Again, not exactly the terms from Easton, but that's what the court wrote uh, for a buyer's protection uh, as fashioned in Easton. So let me take you to Easton just really quick. And again, um, I, I did not uh, highlight Easton for you. I just wanted to show you the case. Um, and again, I will send this to you. Send me an email. Don't put it in the chat because uh, I'll never see it again. But uh, uh, anyway, I, so this was you know a fascinating case uh, for me. Um, and I I think this one I like, right? But you know, someday they'll ask me to opine on on the Easton case. But again, in, in my non legal opinion, but but you know, I've got uh, you know, I've got Easton. I've got uh, it was Easton v. Strasburg. Easton just an easier way to remember it, um, and and it's actually a pretty uh, decent case. But uh, again, as I said earlier, this is going to be you know nine pages of happiness, and here are the facts of the case and all that. And, and roughly, generally, the idea was that the the uh, the seller and the agents were aware of a defect in the property they had to do with some, essentially some slippery slopes um, and nobody bothered to tell anybody else. And so then there's this big lawsuit and the court came back and said, hey, you have a duty. You know, you have an obligation to, to uh, disclose what you knew or should have known. And, and then the real estate agents as well, because they were and of course, you know, in some states where I practice, you know, literally the agents think they, you know, where it's the antithesis of California, right? In California, disclose, disclose, disclose. In other states where I'm practicing, it's like, I don't have to tell you anything, you know, unless you ask me. And, and it's just bad. I, I, I love California for that effect. But the Easton case is a great case. So again, I will send that to you. So, but flipping back over again to field, I just wanted to, I just wanted to highlight a couple of things. They affirm the judgment, obviously. In the third amendment to complain, um, um, the the uh, the uh, company was held that failure to inspect the title documents and to, just, and to determine the scope of the easement. Now this is where, what I disagree with, but here we got the Otai Water District falsely represented that Otai had an easement only for use of the driveway. See now, why are you you know if you if you're not going to give legal advice, then why are you giving legal advice? Okay, so um, in fact uh, the. The easement prevented the fields from from actually uh, from actually exclusively using a major portion of their property. We're going to see in here uh, it was more extensive than had been represented. It included the right for Otai Mason to spill the water into the fields' lands, including where the property sat. Um, and and the and although the buyer's agent was aware the easement existed, they never verified the extent or the uh, represented acreage, nor do they advise the fields to do so. So that's why today you have all these documents, you know, you know, about, you know, you have an obligation to review all these things, that kind of thing. Um, and so then the agent went on further to say that both the acreage and the extent of the easement were erroneously reported. So now they're not only are they commenting on the title report, but or, or on their knowledge. So at this point, by the way, we don't have a title report. Okay, in the east, in the uh, in the uh, field case. All right, and that's going to be pretty telling as well. So the the agent represented that that the acreage and the extent of the easement were erroneously represented. So in other words, nah, it's all wrong. You know, it's like you know, don't listen to any of them. Okay, so so anyway, not only did the agent not inspect the prelim, they didn't even re receive it from the title company until after escrow closed. Oh, God. I mean, this is like, you know, today, I just cannot imagine uh, the, the, I cannot imagine this happening. This was a very bad situation. Um, but you know what? We get that thing where we get those, you know, I want a non-contingent offer and, and I want the buyer to remove all their contingencies. And all that stuff. Folks, you don't want to go there. OK, bad, bad news. And, and again, we're going to get into the title here in just a second. But but uh, but I'm, I'm telling you. They didn't even get the report. So they had nothing they could opine on. Everything else was just their represent the agent's representation. So again, breached their fiduciary duty with the fields by not reviewing the preliminary title report before the close of escrow to verify, among other things, the scope of the easement revealed. So so again, uh, in the TDS, so again, we did not before this have an obligation to to dig to you know investigate to do all those things and even today we we say we have a duty to inspect we don't have a duty to investigate but this is one of those cases that said these people should have known and then you just saw a second ago all the representations that were made that were probably going to create a real problem for this uh for this agent okay so if you don't know about something don't you know don't tell them what you tell them you don't know it's okay 
All right. I've had people in in uh, in live uh, seminars that I've done where they hold up a, their telephone and say, can you say that again? Because I've never heard you say, I don't know. And I said, sometimes you can say, I don't know. It's OK. If you don't know, you definitely say, I don't know. OK, so should consult with a title officer to review the title report. Uh, and to explain the plot uh, and plot the easement. And I'm going to talk to you why this is so very important. You know, you, the, first of all, even if you call the TO, the title officer, you need to make sure that your client calls the TO. And I, I did get a call the other day from someone who, who actually saw my webinar and they were a buyer. And they and they and I didn't know that until about 10 minutes into the conversation. I, I asked them, I said, and who are you exactly? Um, and they said, oh, I'm a buyer and I can't get my agent to explain it to me. And I can't get the title officer to return my call. Hey, that's wrong. Okay. You're paying them for that service. You need it, they need to respond to you. And if you can't get a hold of the agent, then you call the broker. Okay. So anyway, so um, that's all that stuff. And then what else did I do in here? Anything? Um, yeah, again, you've got your, you're all familiar with conduct a reasonably competent, diligent and visual inspection. Uh, and that is out of the, out of the Easton case uh, and disclose all the material facts. So, so this is where I think the court just kind of bootstrapped. I think they had an idea of what they wanted or their opinion to look at, look like, but they found a way to make it happen. And again, who am I to defy the court? I, I you know, the court is, it's the law of the land. Um, I just think, um, you know, I just think it's uh, uh, sad the way that it was written, but that's just my thing. Again, I'm not an attorney, so they can't disbar me. So, um, and I can't give legal advice, so it's okay. So uh, it does establish statute of limitation for breaches, which I think is wonderful, uh, of two years from the date of possession. But in this case, um, it, it, that wasn't the intention. So the seller's broker must diligently inspect the property and disclose material facts. And again, I'm getting way too deep into the legal part of this, but uh, um, uh, the selling broker has no obligation to purchase to investigate public records. These were all the holdings from before. So anyway, I will send this to you and then um, have a ball. Okay. Again, I wouldn't be calling, I wouldn't be telling your client, well, I don't have an obligation to this because you are not an attorney and you don't have the ability to, and, and I can, I can put this document in front of any attorney and, 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 you know, they'll spin you right around. Okay. Because this is, this is, this is the law because it has been published. Okay. All right. So that's all I'm going to say about that. So I showed you a field, um, the Easton case, pretty good stuff. Um, let's get into the issue at hand. Actually, I want to take us back over really quick to where we were. So I could resist. Let's take a look at field. Um, when do you transmit it to the parties? So when to transmit it, not you. It goes to the parties immediately upon receipt. Okay. So if you get it, then, uh, you know, hypothetically, your clients have also gotten it, right? The parties have also gotten it. I would be contacting immediately your client and saying, you know, did you receive it? Uh, when's a good time for us to go over it? Um, do we have an obligation to review it with the parties? And the answer is immediately. Remember, the clock is ticking from when they receive it. And, and one that we like the fact that we have tasked escrow with starting the, the clock for us. Um, but and they're going to send out a document that says that we've approved of it. You should also include this, by the way, in your receipt for reports, because um, your preliminary title is a report. And so you want to be able to document the fact that that uh, it has been received by your client and you need to uh, set up time to go over that. And I don't mean a month from now. OK, so uh, hi, Lena. Um, can the buyer reach out the title officer? Yeah, absolutely. That's what the title officer does. Um, and have them contact the title officer uh, when they have questions. You should still go over with them because you can probably uh, take care of a lot of the questions before they call the title officer. Um, uh, what would you say the percentage of agents who actually read through the title report? <laughs> I hate to tell you. Um, the uh, And again, you're all here today. So I'm preaching to the choir. So you're here because you want to know what it says, right? And so title import, uh, reports are very, very important. And yet, um, I don't know anybody else doing classes on this. Some of the title companies will do it. Um, and, and, I'm, and I'm pleased. And, and I actually have a sample report from one that's really diligent about um, uh, putting these things out. Um, in my uh, law classes, I would have uh, a TO come in and speak about title. Um, and so, you know, who better than the source, right? So they're the ones that are issuing the policy. Okay. So, um, all right. Um, so uh, again, the field case. All right. So um, there, there are most importantly, we have our schedule A's and we have our schedule B's. And we're going to talk about those two things. As a general rule, most of the lawsuits come out of the schedule B's. Okay. And so I'm going to show you how you're going to protect your client. So how do we protect our client? Um, uh, how do you protect yourself and your client? Quite simply, there's a couple of ways to do that. Um, first of all, you always want to get a property profile. So when you're going to be involved in a real estate transaction, the property profile is the least expensive way to get the process started. Okay. 
The uh, preliminary title report tends to cost the title company about five hundred dollars to create it. Um, in, in some cases, you know, I, I will probably at the time of the listing agreement, I will have the title company prepare the prelim because you know I want to be looking at that stuff at the time of the listing. All right. And so, you know, later on, the buyer may decide they want to use a different title company, but that's going to be their thing. At least I'll have a lot of the information uh, ahead, of, ahead of things. So, uh, um, uh, yes. OK, so the question is, and it's a good question. I don't feel confident going through the title report with my buyer. And the answer is that's what we're here today to do. OK, we're here to, today to give you an understanding of what it all says. You know, before this, you know, you were looking at this this hodgepodge of, of language, but uh, having them talk to the TO good idea. I think you still have an obligation to go over it with them. So that's what I would do. So property profile is the first thing I'm probably going to order. Um, I'm going to ask for sold comps. I'm going to ask for any recorded documents. Now, this is before issuance of even the prelim. So I'm asking my title rep to give me these things. I'm going to ask them to blow up the plat map OK, and I ask title to do this, too, when it comes time to issue the title report. And why? Because, you know, these plat maps are awfully small. I'm going to show you a plat map in a second. It's like, you know, how do you read that? OK, most times and they have the ability. They're trying to fit it on a page. Right. So I'll usually have them give me the the page they want to give me. But then I'm going to have to magnify down into the actual property itself. And, and why? Because I want them to plot I want them to color code all of the easements on the property. Now, some of you that have been around for a long time, you know, this is just the way we always did this. Before we started ordering prelims, we always did this. And so why do I want them to plot and color code the easements? I have probably had three conversations today with people that have challenges. I have one where the, the uh, buyer wanted to put in a swimming pool. And then, of course, after they close, and then and all of a sudden, here's the title report. Um, and, and they go to, to try to get a pool put in, and they're told, well, there's an easement across the property. Um, and so, you you know, what is an easement? Now, you all know what an easement is, right? Remember, an easement, again, is the right to use the property of another. It is not ownership of the property, okay? So an easement is the right to use that property. So, you know, we have very common easements. And I'm going to show you some of those today. We have, you know, the, the utility companies, we have, you know, other properties have a right, you know, other parties have a right to come and go across the property, a corner of it or whatever. So easements are a very important thing. And so I'm going to want to see those in my diagram. Okay. All right. Um, so let's take a look at a sample title report. Okay. Uh, I want to, I want to get into that. And I actually have a whole bunch of stuff to show you. And, and I'm, I'm very excited about it because it, it's really cool stuff. So um, I've shown, I, again, we're going to do this right now. We're going to do the preliminary title report, but, but probably the number one question I get from uh, buyers and, and frankly, from agents is how should they take title to the property? And, and so remember what I always tell you when you're writing your offer, you always want to put in, how do you want your name to appear on title? I tell you, never ask the question, how do you want to take title? Okay, because that begets tax and legal advice, right? I'm not doing that. Okay, so it's always, how do you want your name to appear on title? And usually I can look at your driver's license, your DL, your passport, something like that, because you're going to have to prove who you are going in. You're going to have to prove who you are when you go to sell it. So we want to be thorough about that at that time. So here's a really good uh, breakdown, California common forms of, of vesting titles. So if somebody says to me, should I take the property? I had an attorney buying a property. Uh, it was a a same-sex couple back, God, this is 25 years ago. Um, and they came to me and said, we want to buy this property down Hillcrest. I'm representing them as the buyer. And so the the um, the, uh, uh, the one of them's an attorney and the other one is an orthodontist, okay? Uh, so they're both, you know, fairly well-educated. And so the attorney calls me up and says, you know, uh, we want to take the property together. Um, you know, how do we how do we take title of the property? And so my response was, uh, I don't know what to tell you. And so I refer them to sources. So use qualified sources like like this, California Common Forms of Vesting Title, but they may need to talk to counsel about that. And, and as I said, I, I can't tell you how to take title because I'm not an attorney, right? And so, and you are. And so, you know, always... For me, always the best. When I graduated law school, all my clients were attorneys, doctors, lawyers, engineers, all the people that nobody else wanted to work with. And, and so I love working with attorneys, right? But but here, here's the list of things. But I think you need to qualify the source by, by finding out. You know what they did? They called me back and they said, you know what? We looked it up. 
uh, and, and you know, and they're they're pretty good at that. He's an attorney, and he said, "Here's how we're going to take title of the property." And so, and I said, "Good." And then he said, "You knew that all along, didn't you?" And I said, "Yeah." And he said, well, "But you couldn't tell us." I said, "No, because I'm not an attorney. I'm not going to give you legal advice." And folks, that's the best advice I can give you. You are not an attorney. You are not going to give legal advice. Is everybody good with that? Uh, pull up the question here. Got another question, McKay. Uh, um, overhead powder lines. Uh, Clearly visible typically indicate there's an easement uh, that make it. Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, you see overhead power lines, high high transmission uh, lines, right? Um, clearly visible. Why does my thing keep moving? Uh, somehow, McKay, questions are showing up above your question, and it keeps on changing my thing. Uh, bum, 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 bum. Uh, I'm sorry uh, about the title. Okay, um, so um, so McKay's question is a good one. Overhead power lines. You see overhead power lines. I actually have a lawsuit where the where the uh, agent um, photoshopped power lines out of the pictures. <laughs> like, Whoops. <laughs> anyway, that didn't go well. Buyers out of the area. They get there. They go. What are these? Right. So whenever you see those power lines, you got to know there's an easement. Uh, so power lines, but power lines are not necessarily always underground, but they're always above ground, by the way. Sometimes they're underground. Uh, and so if you've read any of the data, the uh, uh, SDG E in our area does a really good, they'll, they'll go, out to your, go out to the property and actually do an assessment. And, and so, uh, you know, the, the amount of uh, transmission a lot of times is far less than even your microwave would emit. So, um, so yeah, but, but McKay, you're absolutely right. You see, you see something like that. Let's assume you're the agent. I think you had an obligation to go inspect the property. Okay. And you get there and you see these high tension lines running along, you know, not, they're not going to be right over the house normally, at least not in uh, California, but they're, they're going to be, you know, how far, Far away is is far enough. I don't know. So good question. Ex excellent question. Okay. So, but it usually triggers you that something else is going on. Okay. So, so let's go back here. I want to get into this. So here's my table of contents. And I, and I do have to thank uh who's the title company sending this? Um, Fidelity. Thank you to Fidelity. Short notice. Uh, I had one that I was using from before, um, but it was literally dated from uh, like five years ago. And so I, I thought, eh, I need to get something a little more a little more current. So um, so we're going to talk you know, the good table of contents. And this, by the way, is a really good breakdown. I've, I've read through the whole thing, highlighted a bunch of stuff in here. We're going to talk about the, the stuff that they're going to say. We're going to talk about the stuff that they didn't tell you. Okay, so what's a prelim? You know, here we're going to talk about a sample. They're going to talk about Schedule A's, Exhibit A's, Schedule B's, and all that kind of stuff. Okay, and then again, I'm going to get my plat map that I'm going to show you here in a second. Okay, so I'm using this as a tool to, to discuss the the actual prelim. I could pull up a prelim, but they did a pretty good job in here. And so that's why I wanted to talk about it. So, so again, prelim... Uh, known as also as a title commitment, and I'm not here to read this to you, okay, but but it's a dated report, and this is really, really important. It's going to be dated, and I'm going to show you why. This is something they're not going to tell you, but, but you know, th that we believe we can issue a title policy based on the enclosed, all right? So it's the sole purpose is to facilitate the issuance of the policy. It is not the policy. Everybody good? So, so normally, they're going to go in, they're going to do their inspection. You can usually get a prelim back within a day, um, you know, I think 10 days is way too much time. Um, but remember that at any point they can amend it. So, you know, they and they're going to tell you that, right? So at, at any, they're going to give you the, the preliminary report, but then usually right prior to closing or settlement, you're going to get the amended report. Um, but again, the title policy doesn't show up until uh, so anyway, and remember, they're they're obligated for matters of record. So they go down. They you know remember that uh, if you're going to encumber a property, you're going to have anything about property. We all know that we can go to the county record where the property is located in California. So if the property is in San Diego County, I know I can go to the San, San Diego County Recorder's Office and I can pull up all the happiness about that property. Why? Because the public, that's constructive knowledge of everything that is wrong, everything that is a matter of record on the property. And so I know that I can go to that place to do that. And again, you and I, I would recommend, you know, it's certainly a good experience to do that, but we want to be careful quoting the things that we have seen. Unless, Lena, of course, you see something in there that wasn't found in the in the prelim, uh, and then I would be calling the title officer before I started sounding the alarm on it um, to make sure that, you know, it wasn't just something that we had missed, okay? All right. Um, okay. Whoops. 
alarms going off. Okay, so anyway, um, matter of record, that's important. So something contained in the county where the property is uh, for the lawyers on this call, you know, in rem jurisdiction, right? So, you know, where the, where the thing where the thing is, okay? All right, so they're going to include these items, estate or interest, we're going to talk about all these, okay? So uh, the record owner of the property, um, a, a legal description of the property, and, and I'm going to talk to you about legal description. It is not what you think it is. Um, and then easements, liens, encumbrances, and other matters that might affect it. Essentially, this is, you know, that we're going to tell you about the title says we're going to tell you about these things and we're going to list them as exceptions. So we're not going to insure, you know, against you. We're going to say we're going to give you an insurance policy, except that it also is going to contain these things. There's no such thing as a property that has nothing on it. So that's what we're going to talk about here in a second. Normally limited to the public record, no reference to off record matters. Because why? Because they're not required to go. Now, you could call the title company and say, can you go down and do a survey of the property? And they may send somebody out there, but it's going to be one of those unusual circumstances. They're not going to be, you know, they're not going to know squatters rights. They're not going to know things like that, right? They don't know, you know, the, uh, the tenant in possession may have rights, things like that. So those are the things they do rely on us for, because again, in most, uh, in most leases, the, they don't get recorded. So they're not going to know about that. So they're going to list exceptions to that. Okay. So, um, okay. Anyway, this is all fictional. So, uh, uh, bum, 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 bum. go here we go sample okay so now down here I get essentially what I'm going to see when I get a title report and they're almost all fairly uniform regardless of who you use they're almost all going to look very similar so they're always going to be addressed to the escrow company whoever that is um, and because they're the ones the disinterested third party hypothetically that disseminates information to everybody fairly that kind of thing and so the escrow company has its escrow number over here on the left side um, there the our file number refers to the file number that the title company looks at so Lena when you call the TO when you call the title officer for information again remember you're calling to get information in advance you're not calling them to relay that information to the client you want the client to call and and get that information so but this is what you will do when you call into the to um, it'll usually be you know at the plant the title plant and you'll say you know i need to talk to somebody about your file number they don't address they don't understand address so you go your file number is 86-1234-19 and and i assure you i've talked to many a title plant and i can tell you they're really good they pick it up right away Okay, uh, that's not an endorsement necessarily, but uh, you know, like I said, they're, they're just there. We rarely see um, lawsuits against title companies. When we do, they're good ones, so they're big ones. Okay, um, you know, versus RESPA and stuff like that, which you know everybody has their turn bad apples. So anyway, that's the title company's order. That's how they talk to you and I. Um, uh, but but this may be the escrow number, maybe over here on the left hand side. Property address is not the legal description of the property. We need to be clear about that. The property address is what you and I identify, 1234 State Street, as it says here, but that is rarely, almost never. Um, and so the law allows, and in, in most jurisdictions, the law allows us to create contracts between parties based on situs addresses. So this is the situs address, the address of the of the thing that we are selling or or whatever. So we can identify them for purposes of contract, but but later on the transfer of title will be about the legal description, the legal address of the property. Is everybody okay with that? But we are okay at law with what we do. We don't have to create this great big long thing and I'm going to show you what that may look like here in a second, but it's going to be the um, we can use the situs address, but just be clear that that is not the legal address, legal description of the property, okay? All right. So we're in the preliminary title report and this is very very important. So date it Okay, and so I want to. I, I need to make this clear because I, I get every once in a while I get this aha moment from people. So, as of January one at seven thirty in the morning, this is what we are prepared to issue. So that's what I said a second ago. Things can happen. Things can change. Uh, a lot of things can happen where they can amend their report. Now, here's the sad part about it: is you got to have a good relationship with your TO. You want to know the minute they see something that changes, but the reality of it is they don't look at it again until about five days before settlement or closing. Um, and then they'll they'll usually pull it moments before close of business. Um, and I'm going to show you an example of a title, um, you know, after it's been recorded. Um, but but they they tend to check 
If it's going to be a recording first thing in the morning, they're going to check right at five o'clock, make sure nobody's slid in and done anything. And I've been involved in situations where somebody has slid in and done something like a Liz Pendens, things like that. But but they're they're probably they're at that last minute they're going to look to confirm that everything is okay. They don't usually tell us about it. But what I want to work with is a title company that does notify me in the event that something happens during the transaction. I rarely see it done, but you've got to have a good relationship with the TO. Okay, um, this is why I don't like uh, seeing fights between uh, buyers agents and sellers agents over who the title company is going to be. Besides the fact that it could be a violation of U.S. code, right? Uh, what twelve U.S. code fifteen. Uh, no, no, I'm going to lose the number. Anyway, it's U.S. code. It's a law that says that you may not require, the seller may not require the buyer to use a particular title company wherever there's a government insured loan. You know, that kind of, it doesn't apply to cash, things like that. But again, real estate agents get in this fight like as if, you know, I, I always tell you, you can't bring you donuts. You know, it's against the law. Um, so, you know, originally it's U.S. code and then we caught uh, civil code, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 133 was created, uh, which was a rewrite of the original RESPA for California's purposes. Uh, but essentially, you know, you 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 may not you you require a buyer to use the seller again. And we we know folks, it's not the seller, you know. But but unfortunately, us as agents, we get involved in that fight, uh, and then something happens where something got missed by title or whatever, whether it happens or not. The buyer always has the ability to sue the seller for treble damages, you know, things like that. So again, not giving you legal advice, but this is why I don't like that fight between buyers and sellers agents uh, over who the title company is going to be. Okay, um, so um, if the buyer requests a certain title company, then then you know I think we need to honor that. Uh, I had a, a, a it never went to court, but I had a situation: eight counteroffers uh, in a property in Coronado, eight counteroffers back and forth between the buyer and the seller over just the title company. So right in on every counter offer, just mention the title company. And it's like, all right, okay. So, you know, I get it. All right. So um, anyway, uh, but it's really important to note that as of that moment in time, 730 in the morning, this is where we are. Okay. All right. Um, so we are prepared to issue or cause to be issued as of that date. Okay. Um, uh, a title policy, right? Uh, title insurance, insurance against loss may be stained by any of these things um, or referred to as an exception, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Uh, I get down to my next paragraph and now I'm in, uh, uh, see, I wanted to show you something else. Uh, like I said, I might get us out of here by, by uh, noon. Um, what was it? Uh, uh, so, which may be sustained by reason of any defect, lien, or encumbrance not shown or referred to as an exception. So, we're going to list the exceptions um, or or those items not excluded from coverage. We're going to we're going to list what those things are. But what we're going to, other than that, we're going to go ahead. We're prepared to issue a policy. And I assure you, this language is all put together to protect the title insurance company. And folks, I want to remind you again, it is an insurance policy. And unless you have a securities license, I probably wouldn't be going to great lengths to explain. You know. The, the insurance aspect of it. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So uh, what else in there? Anything? The printed exceptions and exclusions from the coverage and limitations on covered risks of said policy are set forth in exhibit B. So as I always say, you know, exhibit A, eh, probably not a bit, not as big a deal, but the schedule B's is where all the lawsuits come out of. And I'm going to show you why. Okay. So all arbitrable uh, matters shall be arbitrated at the option of either the company or the insured. In other words, we don't want to get involved in a lawsuit. We'd rather just handle it as an arbitration, much less press about it. Um, and uh, and again, now we have just one person picking. Um, of course, they can't require you to use a particular arbitrator. That's usually decided by the parties in the event that there's a dispute. Um, but title would prefer not to go to court. Um, sorry about that for those of you who like to go to court. Um, Okay, so uh, bup, bup, bup. it is the exclusive remedy of the parties. Everybody got that. And then they talk about their, their deductibles and stuff, and they have to list all that. That's going to be a little bit later on in the report. Um, this paragraph points out the fact and language of preprinted exceptions uh, set forth in Exhibit A and encourages the reading of those forms. I encourage the reading of it. You all are here today, but you know I can tell you something. 99% of the real estate agents that I've ever talked to have never read the title report, read it, much less explained it. So again, this statement is required by California law. Okay, so 
Um, so it is, if it is desired that liability be assumed, and this is for those of you working with, you know, flippers or people that are buying properties at trustee sale and stuff like that, um, normally title insurance is not issued until after um, the transfer of a property from the seller to the buyer. Um, but in some situations, there may be a desire to get something before that. So again, you're paying for an insurance policy, all right, um, but you're going to pay extra for that, okay? So if it is desired that liability be assumed prior to the issuance of the policy, now we're going to be talking about a binder or a commitment. Um, you know, the, and, and that's a commitment to issue a policy, and that's just going to be just short of a title insurance policy. So if they're buying them at the courthouse step, so to speak, actually, my little brother just went uh, on, an, on an auction where he uh, bid at a courthouse steps on a property in Virginia. Um, and we don't do them in California anymore. There really aren't courthouse steps aren't really utilized. Um, it's usually in an office, but people come in and bid on it. It used to be, you know, hear ye, hear ye, who gives me, you know, X for this, this property. Okay. Everybody good with that? All right. Um, so uh, no liabilities intend to be assumed under a prelim and further states that it should be requested if customer desires an assumption of liability prior to the policy. So if you want extra coverage, then you just need to talk to the TO or talk to the title company about that. Uh, and, and I'm sure that they will do it and, and, and for a fee. OK. All right. Um, so they're going to ask you to read the exceptions. And this statement right here in bold print is required by California law. California law says Please read the exceptions shown or referred to below and the exceptions and exclusions, two different things, set forth in Exhibit B of this report carefully. OK, so they're meant to provide you with notice of matters which are not covered under the terms of the title policy. And you need to be thinking about it. OK, so it's important to know that prelim is not a written representation as to the condition of title, all that kind of stuff. And it may not contain everything. And so I'm going to show you when we get to Schedule B's, I'm going to show you where the problems are. <clears throat> OK, so. Um, so here they talk about the form of policy of title insurance. And, you know, there's an there's an Alta policy. There's a CLT, a California land title policy. Um, the Alta policy, there's also an Alta lenders policy, which is a supplemental policy. So be aware that those are out there. So the first thing that it talks about is the estate or interest in the land uh, described as going to be a fee. And again, a fee is the highest form of estate, right? Fee simple, fee determinate, fee absolute, all those kinds of things. Um, question, uh, looks like title information is so important. Yes, it is. How do title companies secure the information? They get it from the county recorder's office. Uh, uh, if it all get hacked and messed up, it's a possibility, I guess. I, I, I don't know. I, like I said, I've been doing this for a very long time. Um, and I, I'm, I know that there are I know that there are things that go wrong. I have not personally had to deal with them. Um, that's how rare they are. And I'm not doing one transaction a year, okay? So uh, in my career, I hate to even think about how many. McKay, how many have I done in my career? Uh, a lot of transactions, let's just say that. And don't only have one claim, um, they're good. Um, but again, like everything else, you know, there's some really good realtors, some really good lawyers, you know, things like that, okay? so So understanding that the interest of the property so the schedule a is talking about the property and the and the title itself we just uh we just had that a second ago no we haven't had it yet okay so so um we're going to talk about the um um the property itself. So when I get in here, this talks about fee is the highest form of estate. You already know about that. You know, so like a freehold estate versus a less than freehold estate, which would be essentially a lease or a rental. Um, so title to said interest uh, estate or interest at the date hereof is vested in. Boom, red flags. Y'all need to be looking at this. Okay, why? Because if you've written an offer on a property where the seller's information is not the same as what is contained here, then you probably, again, I'm not giving you legal advice, you probably do not have an enforceable contract because you don't have the actual owner of the property. So whatever they say in here, this is how it's going to have to be on your on your offer. Is everybody okay with that? I, I mean, it's really important. I've had it happen where I've seen situations where the uh, the, the seller turns out they're not the seller. Or you get in there and you realize, oh, wait a minute, you you know, I thought it was, you know, husband and wife. In fact, you actually hold it in trust. Um, so if you have a contract with husband and wife, you you probably don't have a valid agreement if if it's if it's not exactly as their name appears on title. 
okay? So remember what I said that earlier when I asked the buyer, how do you want your name to appear on title? Because later on, when they become the seller, I need to have that exact way that they took title to the property. And so if I create, if I try to create a contract with someone who is not the actual seller, then I may not have. And by the way, your buyer is relying on you to know what you're doing there. And now you've discovered, that's why I said, get this prelim immediately uh, and immediately get it to the parties and immediately go through all this stuff. Because if you've determined that it is not, the contract is not exactly as it says right here as to who the seller is, you've got some uh, hurry up, uh, fixing uh, stuff you got to do. Okay. All right. Okay. Lena, you good? Everybody okay? All right. So, okay. So that's going to be my, the, 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 the name of, of who holds title to the property, right? I mean, uh, you, when you look up, when you find out who owns the property, you know, you're usually looking at uh, the, perhaps the CRS tax data um, or um, a property profile even, right? Okay. Um, but sometimes we get in here, we find out that it's different. And so you, you need to be attentive to this. You need to go, go to this thing right away. Okay. Because otherwise, like I said, you may not have a contract. Um, and so again, and you're going to need to talk to lawyers about that. Okay. So, um, uh, you, I'm sorry, you have a contract. It may not be enforceable against the owner of the property, the actual owner of the property. I've, I've had it happen where, where you know, husband and wife are on title, but, but uh, you know, husband signs all the documentation, does all the stuff, and the wife is nowhere to be found. And then all of a sudden, you know, we get the prelim and it goes, oh, wait a minute. No, you both own this property. Okay. Um, and so I should make a comment. You see here, you already know you're getting set up. This says LLC, right? Limited Liability Company. So you already know that we're going to be, uh, we have our natural persons, we have our non-natural persons. Natural persons person would be, you know, uh, this person and this person, whatever. Um, you and I don't get into husband and wife or things like that. But if they're trustees, um, if they if they are operating under power of attorney, um, uh, uh, an estate, you know, a probate, a court, you know, all those kinds of things, those are non-natural persons. We're already being triggered here that we're going to need something. We're going to need it in our contract. You know, we call it the RCSD, but title is going to be looking for a copy of the document documentation itself. So when I take a listing and the seller owns the property as an LLC, I tell a seller right away, you're going to need to provide authority. Uh, you're going to need to provide the the uh, LLC or the trust or whatever it is to the title company anyway. Let's go get that, right? Instead of, you know, all of a sudden it's a problem, you know, 10 days into the transaction. And then we find out there's another issue. I've had it happen many a time. I, I always ask the question, okay, you hold title in trust. Is it an and trust or an or trust? So a lot of times I'll see like a husband and wife on the trust. And, you know, an and trust says they both need to sign in order to be valid. An or trust would be only one of them needs to sign in order to be, in order for the agreement to be valid. So those are really important considerations. Remember also your purchase agreement, paragraph number three says that the, those people that own property or those people that are representing the buyer that are, are non-natural persons agree within three days to give that representation, the, the authority to represent that entity to the other side, again, within three days. And so that includes the seller, um, but it also includes the buyer. So we want to be uh, careful about that, that we get that documentation from people up front. So folks, put it in your in your memory that whenever you list a property from a non-natural person or, or whenever you're uh, representing a buyer who's a non-natural person, if it's a trust, I'm going to need the trust certification, probably need to get the whole thing sent over to title and to escrow. Um, I'm going to usually want that sent directly and then get them to tell me they got it. Um, because if there's going to be a problem, and, and we have it happen all the time, Time where they get the document, they go, no, wait a second, we've got a problem here, you know, this, or, or it'll be a, a, a death, right? And so now there's a trust, hopefully there's a trust. Um, and so now they're going to have to, uh, you know, the, the title company is going to scrutinize those documents is what I'm trying to say. Okay, everybody good with that? So when I see limited liability, <laughs> Excuse me. When I see limited liability company, I know it's going to be, you know, I, I need to make sure I get that documentation right away. Okay. We don't have time to wait for them to look for it 20 days from now. We need to have it done now. Okay. All right. Uh, what else in there? Anything? The land referred to herein is described as follows. In other words, wait a minute. I thought we had the street address. No, no, no. That's not going to make it. Okay. So 
what is it? It's going to be exhibit A attached here of here to and made a part here of. Okay. So this is going to be the legal description of the property, not just the physical address. Remember, you and I can create contract using the physical address, but we're going to need the, the legal uh legal on it as well. So here's my here's my legal description. Okay. So clearly much, much different than one, two, three, four Main Street. Okay. So um because this is going to cite where it is. Lot six, track 3103, as shown by the map on file in book 288. This is the legal description of the property. All right. Title needs it. They're going to find it. Don't worry. That's what they do. That's their job. Um, and, and that. And then we also throw in the APN number. I always, I've always said that the APN number is, is like the thumbprint of the property. OK, so so. You know, there. You, if you have an APN number, then you know what the property type is. Um, so, typically, for example, I'll just use an example: a twin home, um, which is two units attached, is the same physical structure as a townhome, right? Uh, uh, same physical structure as a duplex, and that's therein lies the rub. In a duplex, I have one APN number that covers both sides, right? But in a twin home or a townhome, I have two different APN number, three, four, five different APN numbers per unit, per ownership interest in the property. Is everybody good with that? So I just throw that in there for this. Now, if you ask me, have I seen things go wrong with this? And the answer is yes. Um, I, I actually had a situation, and again, I mentioned earlier lawsuits, um, but but you know, I had a situation where I represented a commercial broker in the purchase of a piece of residential property in Oceanside, and the title company messed up. The uh, they they switched the and and in fact it was the the commercial broker that called me six months later and said you know here's what we found out I've been paying the uh, the uh, taxes on the common area the title company has switched the uh, APN numbers and switched the the uh, property characteristics so that the HOA was paying for his property taxes, he was paying the property taxes of the common area because the title had messed up the APN. So don't assume that everything is, you know, that, that you know, you, you got to question these things. Okay. And so needless to say, we got it all fixed. Um, and, it, and it wasn't incredibly expensive. Everybody got even with each other, so to speak. So it worked out really well. Okay. But that's a lot. We like the APN number because that's what the, you know, when, when we go to look at um, the, the taxes and things like that, that's how we're going to find it. Okay. The APN number. All right. Okay. So, um, here's a really good rendition. A number assigned to your property by your county tax assessor. So the number is the location of the parcel of land by book, page, parcel. So 123 is the book number, 456 up here is the uh, page and block, and 78 is the parcel number. So, you know, write that down. Those are good things to remember. Everybody good? Okay. All right. Uh, moving right along. <laughs> Watching my clock. Um, okay. Schedule B. Um, all right, so my Schedule Bs, and and so uh, uh, again, we're still in Section A. So, uh, but Schedule Bs, uh, I'm sorry, we're in Schedule B. Remember what I said earlier? Schedule B. All of my lawsuits are going to be in the Schedule Bs. Okay, so and then I gave you some ideas of how to kind of keep that from happening. So um, I said earlier about I want to see all the recorded documents. So not all title companies do the same thing. Um, I'm finding that in my more current title uh, reports, I'm getting uh, clickable links, so which I really like that. But one of the things that I, and I'm, I'm wishing I had put that in the in the PowerPoint part of it, but that that is I always tell title to pull the Schedule Bs. Now, when I say pull the Schedule Bs, we're going to talk about some of the things that that uh, become problems, and and so um, and specifically the field case. Uh, you know, if you look at the actual the original uh, lawsuit about it, um, there was a, a document uh, by title that said that, and again, they didn't even have the title for it, but it said reference such and such. For further particulars, and whenever you see that kind of language, you you just say, "I want to see that," okay, and I want the client to see that. Don't just send it to me; send it to everybody. But the but that that information, when they pull the Schedule Bs, that means I want the blow up. Now they're sending you the short album version when they do this because it's a lot of paper. Remember the old days when they used to print these things? Well, today they're getting really good. They send you the the title report, and then it has clickable links for you to look at those things. Do not ignore those things, all right? So we're going to talk about some examples of that here in a second. So um, exceptions will appear in policies, um, standard coverage. So taxes or assessments, right? Because they change all the time. So they're going, to, they're going to list those as an exception. They're going to tell you that they're there, and they're going to tell you what they are, but they're, but they're going to say 
they're subject to change all the time. Okay, so um, uh, facts, uh, rights, or interests and claims uh, not shown by the public records, but that could be ascertained by an inspection of the land, which is on you, right? Um, on on the on the buyer. Um, easements, liens are recorded, and we talked about that, that might not be shown by public record. Again, we want public record. Um, title wants public record. Any encroachment encumbrance. So encroachment, you know, the, the tree hanging over you know, you know, the property. That's the most classic example. Um, I had one um, in La Jolla where the, uh, the, the houses were on uh, uh, Terrace terraces and the neighbor um, uh, had uh, was watering would flood their lawn in order to water it, but the water would come out underneath the fence to our parcel, which became an an encroachment, right? Because it's water and, and we didn't want that. And so they obviously hadn't secured the land upstairs so that water wouldn't come through, but that's an encroachment, folks, okay? And so, um, and again, my easements, I might not see those physically by looking at them, but we need to be aware that they're out there, okay? So again, I like having the buyer have the, uh, um, the, uh, what? Oh God. I don't know what that means. Anyway, so I like the buyer having a survey done of the property. And, and clearly, you're selling a house on Pacific and Solana Beach. You, you need to be uh, having a geo survey as well, uh, just to confirm that there aren't any underground caves and things like that, because there are. All right. OK. Uh, unpatented mining claims, all these things. Any lien or right to a lien for services, uh, kind of like a mechanics lien, maybe? OK, good. All right. Everybody OK? All right. So uh, these exceptions do not appear in the Alta policy. This is why, you know, we, uh, <clears throat> uh, where did I go with that? Okay. I forgot what my point was. Um, okay. Uh, then, then my schedule B's, section B's, as of the day, exceptions to coverage in addition to the printed exceptions. So in addition to just the general stuff that we told you just above, we're going to be talking specifically now about our property taxes. So including general and special taxes, personal property taxes, maybe, right, um, if any, and any assessments collected with the taxes uh, for the for Coming that coming year when this was created, okay, uh, a lien not yet payable. So in other words, we're going to insure again. I'm sorry, we're going to claim against a future lien. We're not going to do that because we don't know. So unpaid taxes, however, we're going to tell you here in a second whether or not there are unpaid taxes. So the first item shown in Schedule B is a statement regarding the amount and status of any unpaid taxes for the current year. So again, taxes now a lien, now a lien, now due or respective installments, okay? And so that's when we get down into my paragraph number B, okay? So taxes shown in Schedule B, um, whether they've been paid or not paid, and it'll break them down. So uh, I see this very commonly when somebody is a, a, perhaps a flipper, you know, they, they will have you know, we we always our contract by default says that the that taxes will be prorated. So when when the sale occurs, um, if the seller is going to, because the seller doesn't have to pay the taxes, sometimes the buyer will pay the seller's taxes, right? But but there's that line that says the date of recordation. That's the date that, that is recorded. The transfer from the seller to the buyer has been recorded, and so from normally from that point forward, the buyer becomes obligated for whatever taxes uh, they're going to accrue. But again, remember the title, the um, the title company, nor the county recorder's office are going to know what those taxes are until we notify the assessor's office. You know how much. The sales price was, right? Because it's an ad valorem tax, which means it's based on the value of the property, okay, at the time of sale. So the buyer's taxes may be very different than the seller's taxes. And so they're just not going to know those numbers when they're looking at it, uh, when they when we uh, initially do the transfer. Usually takes about 30 days. And then the, the buyer will get what's called a supplemental tax. Um, uh, and again, we we have that in your, uh, in your, um, statewide buyer and seller advisory. It's in your local area disclosures for San Diego. Um, you need to be telling the buyer because, you know, listen, I've had that call enough times where the buyer calls you up after closing and they say, hey, I thought you had the seller was paying all the taxes. And you know, the answer is, yeah, up until date of reportation. But now the county will issue a supplemental tax that says you're short. So in other words, you know, the seller was paying $100, you know, uh, a year for taxes, <laughs> good luck, $100 a year for taxes up until date of recordation, but it was based on how much the seller paid for the property when they bought it. And so now recordation occurs, you paid a different sum, usually higher. And so your tax will now be based on 
the what you have paid, but you know, there's nobody sitting around there waiting to do the math on you. So, but within about 30 days, the county will send you a bill and says, you know, here's your tax. You need to pay the supplemental tax to kind of it's kind of like putting a, a, a boat through a, a levee, right? Through you know the Panama Canal. We're just gonna, you know, have to raise the water level a little bit and get that. Uh, actually, that's a pretty good analogy, I guess, um, or metaphor, I should say. So property taxes, including general, same as we saw before. However, here's what they look like. So the first installment, of course, is uh, is expires or, or is delinquent on December the 10th. And, and so as, as some of you hopefully don't know, um, if you send your 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 money in to pay your taxes and they don't get it until December the 11th, they return it to you because you've got a penalty pay. OK, so they are delinquent on the 10th. So after the 10th, that's why it is the busiest day. December the 10th is the busiest day in San Diego County at the post office, right? Because people were just lining up to pay their stuff, you know, by mail. Uh, okay, so they waited until the last minute. So it had to be postmarked, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but uh, I, I guess I don't like fighting with fate. So I always pay them early. I mean, you're going to have to pay them anyway. You may as well pay them in advance. So, so this document says, here's my first installment. And it was $833.45. Uh, and that's the amount that you will owe um, as long as you make the payment before the 10th. After that, penalties are going to apply. OK, so what's the penalty? The penalty is going to be essentially 10 percent um, uh, that you need to send the check in with the, with the eight hundred thirty three dollars plus the 10 percent penalty if if they're going to if you're going to pay it after the 10th. So the 11th, the 12th, 13th, I don't care. You know, I just missed it by a day. No, you missed it, period. There's no by a day. OK, then there's a second installment. And in this case, it says um, the second installment would have been roughly the same amount um, valid again for April the 10th. OK, um, after which penalties apply. Now, um, so penalty, including cost, would be if you haven't made that one, then it's going to be ninety three dollars and thirty four cents. So it's going to be more than 10 percent uh, if it's paid after April the 10th. OK, is everybody good with that? Land value, ignore it. Uh, improvement value. So there are formulas that the county comes up with to determine the valuation of the property. It'll be the property and or any improvements that are on it. Um, do not confuse this with the appraisal of the property. And, and I and I get this, you know, clients call you up and they go, hey, you know, I just looked at the county records and, you know, my property is worth a heck of a lot more than, it, than, it's, than it's worth. You know, that kind of thing is like, well, let's not confuse that. All right. So the land value is what the county attributes the value of the land to be. And then the improvement value they attribute. The, the, the additional sums for the, the value of the improvement. That's for their purposes. Um, by the way, all of this can be fought by filing a claim against the, the Board of Equalization, you know, Franchise Tax Board. Um, and there are courts that do that. You know, I have a good friend who's actually a judge in one of those courts um, where they actually hear these hearings. So you can always fight it, right? And and so, and I've done it. I've been successful at it. And for those of you looking for a way to endear your client, you might be talking to them about helping them out to show that maybe the value of the property hasn't gone up as much as the assessment went up. Because remember, the property assessment is 2% of base. Um, it cannot be in, increased more than 2% per year. So uh, those, those are things that you might be able to even help your client with. I, I, I've done a lot of those in the past. Most of my clients just eat it now, but uh, it just is what it is. So, but just be aware that this value right here is not the um, is not the uh, appraisal value. It is not the value of the property. It is going to be based on the breakdown that the county attributes to the property, based on the the price that the property is sold for. Okay, all right. Exemption seven thousand dollars more than likely my homeowners uh, homestead exemption. Um, the homestead exemption available to those that are going to live in the property. That kind of stuff. They actually have to fill out a form. It's not automatic. You got to uh, fill out the form. Um, uh, Jordan Marks is the new county assessor, uh, and uh, he'd probably be very helpful with that. He actually worked with us at uh, SDAR. He was our government affairs director for a period of time, um, and uh, moved on to become. Uh, he worked actually the board of equalization for a while. And now he's uh, the county assessor and, and more power to him. Jordan's an awesome guy. Uh, a lot of people don't know he was the president of the student council at uh, Miracosta College, where I was a, a, an instructor for 15 years. So uh, anyway, so be aware that this is not automatic. OK, everybody go with that. All right.
supplemental. We talked about that already. That's the after tax. That's the tax. The, that's the difference in the tax that the seller was paying. Now we have the buyer paying a different tax. And here's the difference between what the seller was paying and what the buyer was paying to try to get everybody level again. Um, so it'll al almost always be more, um, uh, but normally it's because the buyer is paying more money for the property than perhaps the seller paid for it. Hi, Deborah. Um, after sale, can the county reassess the property and increase the pro Oh, yeah, sure can. They're limited as to how much they can increase it per year. So uh, the, county, the, the county assesses it at the time of the sale, and then under most circumstances can only raise it by a certain amount. Um, always an appealable event. I, I, most people just give it up and they don't. I, I would recommend it. I think it's a good experience. Um, but, you know, obviously you got to be able to prove it's not going up as fast as the county thinks it is. Uh, supplemental taxes, uh, taxes, uh, reassessments, if any, which attach to the land upon transfer of ownership or new construction. So so in California, at least, our taxes are based on on uh, the, the odd valorum, based on the value paid for the property. Um, in other states where I'm licensed, um, they actually charge you property tax, personal, uh, personal taxes as well. So, um, you know, taxes on your car. You know, things like that. Um, you know, so so the property taxes may be lower, but they make up for it with the other taxes. OK, um, so then they make a, a good little note in here. From this point forward, the items shown in the prelim will normally be shown chronologically by date. And that's an important thing to remember. And why? Because we're going to start to look for delinquencies and things like that. You know, whenever something was filed and then when it affected the, the value of the or, or the ability to transfer the property. OK, so. Um, how frequently the county assess, reassess, they normally do it. Um, good question, actually, Deborah. So they normally do it upon sale. But uh, and then and then every year they have the ability to uh, increase based on limitations. But then there's also an improvement done to the property, right? You you uh, you apply for permits to put in a pool. Um, they may think that increases the value of your property. They can reassess the property. You do a room addition, you know, things like you add a floor, you know, things like that. They could reassess at that point. So just figure any time that you apply for a permit, which I'm not going to tell you not to do that, but anytime you apply for a permit to do something, um, they can. Can reassess at that time. Um, I, I had a, a property in uh, Del Mar, um, and I, I love this place uh, on Crest Road. Um, and the uh, the the uh, county record showed it to be an 800 square foot army barracks, an old army barracks. And I sold this place like in 2000, uh, I think it was roughly, uh, might have been 1998. Um, but the county record showed it as an 800. You're looking at this place, it is 40, it's over 4,000 square feet all day long. It's huge. Okay, clearly not 800 square foot army bear. Well, what happened was they applied for the permits. They had all that. The, the seller had all that stuff, but the county never, and the county knew, you know, the county was aware of it, but had never updated the tax base. So, you know, do you have an obligation to tell the county? Well, I don't know. When we did the sale, they certainly uh, figured it out. They did not go after the previous owner for anything because it was their fault. Um, but but they but they were able to reassess the property based on the new owner and based on the square footage of the property and, and it turned out it was 4,200 square feet. Clearly, I mean you can eyeball that one and tell it's not 800 square feet. Okay, so um, usually chronologically by date, and this is going to be an important thing for us. Although this approach is normal from the standpoint of the title examiner, the items are not necessarily shown in any strict order of priority. So the date of recordation and the date of priority are not necessarily the same thing. Everybody okay? Again, this is where all my lawsuits are. All right, so. Con Con covenants, conditions, and restrictions. I'm going to tell you, all properties have CCNRs, um, and and I, I get people that argue with me about it, and and so so like I always say, like like you know, my home is uh, uh, an 800 square foot. Actually, coincidentally, uh, 800 square foot. It looks like it's leaning to one side. Um, it's getting ready to fall over. Built in 1952. Um, uh, so can I remodel the property? Well, I'm going to have to apply for permits, right? Can I build a 16-story high-rise on my residential property? And the answer is probably no. Um, there's going to be, all properties have some form of restriction on them. And so, so, and, and clearly, would I love to have a 16 story high rise where I'm, oh, yeah, I can make a fortune off of that, right? But the answer is no. Um, I can't even put a second floor on. Um, in fact, my neighbor who paved uh, just a little entryway to their driveway, little, it was like two feet of asphalt, got a, a fine from the city of Del Mar for doing an improvement without getting a permit. It's like, really? So, and it just is what it is. So, just understand that. That 
you, you, we associate typically CCNRs with a subdivision home or a planned unit development or a condo or town, you know, things like that. But the fact of the matter is most of all properties have some form of restriction on them. That's why I think the TDS is kind of, you know, it says CCNRs or other matters affecting the property. All properties have some condition uh, on them, right? That you, you may not build a high rise. You may not use it for commercial purposes. You may not use it for industrial purposes. You may not open up a, a dry cleaning plant, you know, that kind of thing. So when was it recorded? Those were recorded back in 1969. They're going to usually be the furthest back thing that we're going to have. So again, we're going to be looking in, 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 in order. But we're, but this this exception in here is going to say that it omits a covenant condition restriction based on one of these protected classes. All right. And so I think that's incredibly important. Why? Because, see, these documents got recorded in, in San Diego. Down, uh, San Diego proper uh, had a, had a, uh, a restriction against Semites owning property. I mean, what a horrible time. You know, our, our past is riddled with some really ugly stuff. But it said, you know, Jewish people may not own property in San Diego. Well, I think we all know on a number of levels that that's just wrong. Wrong, right. So rather than us going in and changing each and every single document, we're just going to say, hey, you know what? Any time any reference to the protected classes is just going to be eliminated. OK, so so it says right in here, you know, uh, uh, the uh, the protected classes, unless and only to the extent that the covenant you know, is not in violation of state or federal law, is exempt under one of these things, relates to a handicap, but does not discriminate against handicapped people, um, provide that a violation, therefore, shall not defeat the lien of any mortgage or deed of trust made in good faith and for value. And so you have this in your prelim, and I've heard of people trying to get out of transactions based on the fact that they see a CCNR that says, you know, that that they may not buy property there. Those are all eliminated. So it's not going to, they need to talk to an attorney. They got that kind of an argument that they, they don't want to buy in a place that says that when you have a document that says we're just going to eliminate it's just a general we're going to eliminate it okay um again like i said it goes back into a time that that we're not necessarily proud of but you know it's uh, and rancho santa fe same thing you know and that's technically san diego um and, and same kind of rules and so uh you know it's just we're just going to create it we're just going to create now here are the ccnrs um and anything that references these things we're just going to obliterate them they don't exist anymore okay um so restriction is a limitation upon the use of the property and generally establishes what improvements, things like that that you can do, okay? All right, easement. I, I already talked to you a little bit about what an easement is. Again, an easement is the right to use the land of another. It is not title to the property, but it, but it also says normally that you may not block it. So for example, people say to me, they say, well, I own this piece of property, city uh, comes along and installs a sidewalk. And then they have the gall to tell me that I'm responsible for maintenance of the sidewalk. Well, because the city has an easement, right? There's setbacks, there's things like that. And so the city can, can perhaps come in uh, and, and just go ahead and install a sidewalk, which is on your property, which you are responsible for. OK, so so let's not, you know, those of us that are real estate agents out there, we, we need to be careful about the statements that we make. But an easement and in this case, uh, a good easement, this is one that you're, you're going to more commonly see granted to whoever, SDG and E, P and E. Uh, PG&E, whatever. Um, it's a public utility and, and, and for other incidental purposes. So I have the right to enter your property to fix the blown power lines, right? Or the uh, transformer that exploded or things like that. So, you know, most utility companies have easements on pretty much every property. Okay. And that's just how it's going to be. So it's going to be a, a general easement. Okay. So when was it recorded? Ah, coincidentally enough, when were my CCNRs? January 25th of 69. June of 15th of 69, uh, the utility company puts an easement on the property, says that we'll have the right to come in and, uh, and uh, you know, access the property for purposes of maintaining the easement. OK. All right. Um, so easement up here, uh, they, they put that's good. All right. Easement is a right or interest of another property in the land. So in other words, not the owner of this property, which entitles them, you know, some benefits, poles for wires, pipelines for sewer um, to make use or make roads. 
Um, yeah, they can put a road across your property some, in some cases. Um, occasionally, the exact location is not necessarily disclosed in the public records. Remember what I said earlier? I want you to plot and color code the easements. So I want to see those in my, in my blown up map. I want to see where those are. It's a process that title will do. I, I have not heard of a title company charging for it, but I think it's incredibly necessary. And I think you should have the buyer sign off on it, specifically sign off on that document. Okay. So number three, in this case here, a deed of trust. And so remember that in California, you know, we don't do mortgages. You know, those are two party documents, a mortgage or a mortgagee. We do loans or liens secured by deeds of trust. Again, it's a year of law school. I don't recommend going to law school just to talk about that. But it is a deed of trust is a security is the security instrument um, uh, attaching uh, the property. OK, question. Um, OK, um, uh, access easements are granted to adjacent properties constantly. Okay, so uh, uh, McKay's making a really good point. So um, we call that a contiguous property. So sometimes easements will benefit a, a contiguous owner. So uh, uh, the immediate owner next to it, um, and that would be more of a, of a specific easement uh, rather than a general. Um, let me see, uh, trying to... to uh, why these access easements or owners blocking access? Yeah, uh, I agree with you. Um, I, I, you know, I, I had a case in the ranch where the the the, um, the 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 here's the owner of the property. There's a neighbor who has an easement across a portion of the other property for purposes of growing a garden. Um, and so, of course, the property owner that that is encumbered by the easement comes to me and says, "Well, how do I get rid of that?" Well, you get their permission. <laughs> I sold a property. Oh my God, it was on a street called Villa Terrace. Um, uh, the owner of the property, and this was 30 years ago, uh, but a great example, the owner of the property a big broker. I, uh, to this day, I have tremendous amount of respect for uh, for this guy still. Um, but he was a big broker, and he had he had taken the property in trade for another property that he owned. And so, but now he owns this one. Okay. And so, you know, during the course of the the property, uh, the, the the PR being ordered, um, I get the PR back, and it says, and and of course, my buyer, right? Um, and and my buyer, and and so I'm looking at the PR, and it says that the neighbor to the north has the right to, uh, uh, let, let me back up, the property itself is giving the neighbor to the north uh, a right to park in their carport in exchange for these people uh, being able to use part of this property as a garden. Gardens, ah. Anyway, so here's this garden. So when you looked at the at the boundaries of the property, there's this little part niched out where the garden is. And so I called the TO at the time, and and uh, and, and I remember asking them specifically. You know, I'm understanding that in exchange for uh, you know the the gardening on the property, the neighbor can park in our carport and the and the title company looks at it and goes yeah you're right they can i said but we're going to make a garage and they go and you're going to need to give her a clicker <laughs> and so i'm like no anyway my buyer big big uh, san diego union tribune per person uh, at the time i'm sure they're retired by now but uh i went back to the buyer and i said i don't know here's my read and i talked to the to you need to call the to I, I i reached out to the owner broker and the first first statement out of their mouth was you're just trying to get out of the deal i'm suing everybody and i go i don't know man you insisted on the title company you call your title officer and and have them explain it to you um then we're just going off a report that you furnished and so sure enough that's what ended up happening. You know what was interesting about that? Again, so don't assume things, folks. But if you see irregularities on the property, you know you need to be looking for that. But you know, here the the uh, TO explained it to the owner of the property. He went to because we weren't going to take it if the neighbor could park in, in the carport because we're going to make it a garage and we're not going to give her a clicker. And so essentially the broker went to the neighbor uh, who was at this point like 96 years old. So so the estate uh, released the, you know, we released the garden, we released the right to, to park in the carport. But you know what, if you miss something like that, that's a doozy. And this is one of those 
those reasons. And God, you know, now I'm thinking about it. This came uh, that that uh, for me personally was before the field case. Um, you need to be reading these title reports. Um, and again, I'm not here to give you legal advice, but I will help you if, if you're having trouble with something and, and, and I can at least give you a direction. Send me an email, please. Uh, I'm happy to help you. I cannot give you insurance advice, cannot give you legal advice, cannot clearly give you title advice, but I might be able to direct you to an authority or maybe to an attorney. I don't know. So, so now I'm back to my uh, deed of trust. Um, oh yeah, we closed that transaction, by the way. They were, the, the broker was a really good broker. And, and like I said, I, I still have a tremendous amount of respect for him and, 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 uh, and he went on to do other things, but I think he learned a lot of stuff in that transaction he wasn't aware of before. By the way, I had graduated from law school. <laughs> so it's like, I read stuff. Okay. So you definitely need to read, you don't have to go to law school to learn how to read things. Okay. So a deed of trust back to my, my latest subject, a deed of trust. Again, again, remember my mortgage is mortgage order mortgagee. My, my, in California, we do uh, deeds of trust. So I'm going to have a trustee, a trustor, and a beneficiary. How much is it? It's a million dollars. Okay. So that's, you know, what that's entry level housing anymore. Um, dated, aha, January the 14th. Okay. January 14th. Who's the trustor? Well, the trustor happens to be the, the, the person who took out the loan. Okay, who's the trustee? Well, the usually the person that's responsible for you know for taking the property back. Um, if they they have to take the property back, if you don't make the payment to who? The beneficiary, right? You don't make the payment to the bank, then the trustee takes the property back on behalf of the bank, and then and and then you're in the cooker. For, so all that over a million dollars. Okay, loan number, recordation number, notice 2014, January the second. So it was recorded the next day. So remember what I said earlier about. Title insurance not being required by law in California. I don't know a lender who isn't going to require title insurance. I don't know, right? That's why I said earlier, I see that when I see the lawsuits, it's you know, cash transactions. The agent says, well, you can save the money, you don't need title insurance. That that's a huge error. I, I would not be making that statement. Okay. So again, you, then you definitely at that point everybody's gonna be talking to counsel. So um, but uh the title, the lender says, I want to insure my interest on this property. So that's why you have set, two different title policies. Normally you have the seller's title policy, but then you also have the buyer's lender's title policy that normally the buyer pays for. And so for those of you who remember your contract says that if you've got the seller paying for a certain title company, let's say there's that fight between title company, you know, the between the agents over who the title company should be. And now the buyer ends up paying an increased premium for the lender's policy because they were required to use by the seller that other title company. You know, listen, I don't want to be in the, I don't want to be the agent that gets called to task on that because that's definitely going to be uh, a court time, which uh, again, I'd love to go to court, but I'm not going to go there for that reason. Okay. All right. So uh, deed of trust, and this goes under what I just told you a minute ago. I'm pretty sure everything. Yeah. Okay. So uh, they talk about the promissory notes. Don't worry about that. You just need to know there's three parties. Uh, trustee has limited powers. You know, they can't just take the property. You know, they, they, it, we have judicial and non judicial excuse me, judicial, non-judicial foreclosure. So in California, we do non-judicial because it's a deed of trust, trustee sale. Um, but in states like Florida, we have a judicial foreclosure where we actually, the bank has to go to the court to get the property back away from the delinquent borrower. And, and that takes a much, much longer process. Um, we should probably do a whole class on that. But um, in California, they can get the property back a lot faster, but they also give up a lot of rights um, against the, the borrower. Okay. All right. So that was the short, the, the short of it. Okay. All right. Um, again, we probably do a whole class on that. So schedule B, section B, um, again, I'm, I'm in my deed of trust. So, so remember what was my deed of trust date back up here was uh, January of 14 uh, for a million dollars. Then I get down here and I see another one. There's another deed of trust. And this is for a much smaller amount um, at a later time. So six months later, they put another deed of trust on there for 40,000. So normally your, your uh, junior mortgages will be a lesser amounts, higher interest, but lesser amounts um, than the primary mortgage. So the primary mortgage in this case would have been a million dollars. And then they had what appears to be a second that was put on the property, again, subordinate to the original deed of trust. But this is a deed of trust as well. And there's no limit as to how many you can have. Um, you know, you can have one, five. I had a, tra a transaction where there were five uh, deeds of trust. Your job, when you get this document, you need to be looking at these numbers. You need to be adding up all the deeds of trust and all the 
judgments and all that kind of stuff. And if those numbers exceed the value that the borrower is paying, for, the buyer is paying for the property, then that's a heads up, folks, that this is a transaction. Unless there's something going on that you're not aware of, that it's probably going to have some challenges in closing. Now, I've done them where they were that you know, where the banks had all agreed. We call them short sales, you know, things like that. I think you're going to see a lot more of those in the coming years. But just be aware of the fact that uh, that we have a, a, a primary loan, and then we have junior liens or subordinates, um, a first, a second, a third, uh, sorry, a second, a third, a fourth, a fifth, whatever. They tend to be in increasingly shorter, smaller amounts, uh, shorter payback periods, larger, higher interest rates, more penalties, um, because they're at risk. If the primary mortgage forecloses or or really goes to sale, because we don't do foreclosure unless we have a mortgage, but if they take the property back, the junior liens are we, we say extinguished, but really just the security interest is extinguished. So the buyer could still be on the hook for, or the, I'm sorry, the seller could still be on the hook for $40,000 if the primary million dollar mortgage uh, forecloses, but it's just no longer a secure debt. And, and again, the, the the party that gave them the forty thousand wants it to be a secured debt, so they'll have additional terms in that agreement that that discuss their rights uh, of collection against the borrower after the the uh, foreclosure. Because again, it takes away their security interest because because they were the second and they knew that risk when they did it. Okay, again, a year of law school, uh, you know, you probably don't want to hear all that. Parties have agreed that this last deed of trust is second or junior to the deed of trust shown. Uh, subordination agreement may be a separate instrument. Sometimes the second, sometimes the first will allow the second to become the first very rare. We see them in construction situations, you know, where developers are building properties and and, and then they'll have somebody subordinate the lien to something else, but uh, not normally going to happen in your residential world. Okay. Again, uh, I, and again, I don't want to get too deep into that, but because, because you really don't need to know it for one thing. And, and plus, I think you're getting close to legal advice. Um, an abstract of judgment. So what does that mean? So that means, in other words, um, somebody got involved in a lawsuit. It could be a lawsuit. It could be a, a divorce decree. It could be a lot of things, but there will be an abstract that gets filed. You don't actually file the, the court holding with the, with the county. You file the abstract. So it'll be a document that'll say, this is how much money you owe these people. So let's take a look. So this says in here that that LLC, so again, I'm always looking to make sure it's the right right uh, party, right? If, it's, if it turns out one of these is not the right party, I've had that conversation where title will say, no, no, we're going to get rid of that. Don't worry about it. A lot of times title can remove a lot of things. But um, but they're not going to remove it if it's a real abstract judgment because they don't want to pay it, right? So, but in this case, the debtor again is the same people that we've been selling the property for, the, the still the same seller. Um, oops, a, a pool company. Okay, when uh, 2011. So it was entered on 2011, and yet up here, my date of my deed of trust was 2014. Uh, isn't that kind of unusual? Here's another one, uh, 2014. So where does 2011 come from? Um, interesting. All right. Uh, so um, the county, wherever that is, the court. Uh, so this was this was an abstract that was probably obtained against the the. Uh, the buyer, perhaps, um, and uh, a pre-recorded judgment against the buyer that, again, will attach all of the buyer's interests in property in the county. So I, the, the, it's a possibility that's where that's come from. Here's how much it is, including penalties and costs. Title is not going to let this transaction settle until that money is paid because they don't want to have to pay it. Okay. All right. So Okay, and then down here, as of date of recording, it imposes a lien on this and all other real or personal property now owned or hereafter acquired by the debtor. So the reason I said title's not going to want this one to close um, without that being paid off is because it will immediately attach to this. Uh, but again, it says the debtor is the seller. So that part doesn't make any sense. I'd probably put the buyer's name in there just for clarification. But okay, um, a, a tax lien um, again, now we're going to get into taxes. And so remember, your taxes are always a lien. Um, and some of them you're aware of, some of them you're not aware of. Okay. So remember my supplemental taxes, I'm not aware of what those are yet, but we're aware of the fact that it's coming. That's why you must give the buyer the SBSA, or if you don't give them the SBSA, then you got to give them the notice of supplemental tax, the S SPT form, this uh, supplemental property tax disclosure. So uh, again, that's the uh, law. That's a law that requires you to do that. So the SBSA, they satisfies that, but you could also, if you don't have the SBSA, then you could use the SPT form, CAR form, SPT. So a tax lien 
In this case, the U.S. of America, which means a federal tax lien. Ooh, not good. Big tax lien. Um, once again, it's the same seller. Um, here's their federal serial number. Here's the amount they owed. Got $345. Okay, it ain't gonna close. All right. Uh, I had a transaction where the property uh, we were selling the properties back in Tucson, Arizona, back forty years ago, forty plus years ago, and the sales price was was sixty five thousand dollars for a house, and the federal tax lien was two hundred sixty five thousand dollars. And it turns out that the IRS had just not removed the lien against the property. I had to go to to the then uh, chair of the House Appropriations Committee, uh, Senator Dennis DeConcini, who I went to his office to have them uh, to pressure the IRS to remove the tax lien, and we were successful in moving forward. So um, again, this was recorded in 2011. Again, all this before the other liens uh, uh, took place, okay? All right. Um, Schedule B, Section B, again, a lien. So this now, now we're going to talk about a state lien. So we talked about this, the federal lien. Now we're going to talk about the state lien in favor of the state of California. Here's the amount. Here's who it is. Same debtor right there, taxpayer. Uh, and this was recorded in 2013. So um, so uh, how do they buy this property with these liens that were pre-purchase? Um, they would have come over and attached, right? So state lack tax liens become a lien on all property and the rights of two property, including real and personal of the parties uh, liable. Okay. Uh, pending court action. So again, uh, whoops, question. Let me, before I, I, I go further into this, because a lot of this, we're doing pretty good. We're almost done, actually. Uh, Lena, how do you think tax lien investment versus the actual property investment? How do you think tax lien investment? I don't understand the question. Uh, how do you think tax lien investment versus the actual property investment? I don't know. I don't know what the question is. Uh, try it again. Uh, rewrite it for me, Lena, will you please? Um, thank you. Thank you that. I like you asking questions because you ask really good questions. Um, so item number eight on here happens to be a pending court action for all the lawyers in the room today or all the paralegals in the room today. You know what that is. That's called a list pendants. And you don't have to take four years of Latin, which I did. Um, did it help in law school? <laughs> you know, I don't think so. But, uh, you know, a list pendants is Latin for lawsuit pending. Um Okay, my water. Um, so a, a, a lawsuit pending, um, they, they have to record it in the county where the property is. Again, in REM jurisdiction, they have to record it in the county where the property is. Because remember, again, the expectation is anybody interested in that property can go to the county and look up that number. And, and again, you're doing most of this online, um, but you're going to go in, you're going to look up the property and it, because you you know that any liens against it are going to be in the county where the property is, right? Um, and so this is a, uh, a lien. Um, this is a pending court action. Um, I was interviewed on Channel 8 when uh, Duke Cunningham had bought the property out in Rancho Santa Fe, and, and uh, he was a neighbor of mine in Del Mar on Mercado. Um, I didn't live on Mercado, but I guess he was a neighbor a couple blocks away. Anyway, he had sold that property to one of the um, one of the people bidding for federal contracts, and so now the um, the Department of Justice filed a list pendants against his property in Rancho Santa Fe because they believed that they that he used the money you know that he had uh, gotten on the sale of the Mercado property to purchase that other property, and and so the question by the by the media was um, you know can you still buy the property? The answer is oh sure you can, you just can't get. You know, no title insurance company is going to insure the title of the property with a list pendants on it. They 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 would insure it perhaps if you want to try to bond around it, but um, you can get a bond that would satisfy the lien in the event that they were successful in their outcome of their lawsuit, which by the way, ultimately they were, and they took the property back. So if you had paid cash for the property, or if you had gotten a loan and gotten title insurance, you know, again, title might've had you bond, you know, in the event that the, that the DOJ was successful, um, in which case, you know, you would have lost the bond, but you know, you've been limited, limited on your on recovery, but, but at the end of the day, list penance, very bad thing. It has to be about the property. Okay. Um, I was involved in a sale of a property on, uh, 10th Street, uh, 10th Street in Del Mar, where um, the the buyer decided not to purchase the property because they heard a rumor that the fire station was moving across the street. 
And so the seller who hired me to sell the property um, it happened, to, uh, it was currently listed, it was currently under contract, but now the the, the seller who happened to be an attorney uh, was litigating against the buyer, trying to get the buyer's earnest money deposit because they'd already removed all their contingencies. Folks, be very careful. Um, and so the seller hired me to come in and now sell the property again to someone else while the lawsuit was still going on. Well, intelligently so, the attorneys realized that that, they're, that uh, they didn't need a list pendants against the property because the dispute was really over the deposit. So there was no list pendants against the property. I sold the property again, even while the lawsuit was still going on. Um, and, uh, um, and ultimately the seller did get the buyer's deposit. So at trial, so, but pe lawsuit pending, you talk to your broker, call the TO, have your buyer call the TO, you know, what's going on here. In this case, I've got the plaintiff um, is a uh, California LLC. The defendant, again, is the owner of the property. It's in the county where the, where the, it's filed in the county where the property is, um, and it affects real property. So in this case, it did affect real property. In the case I gave you where the, the, the seller was suing the buyer to get their deposit, the, 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 everybody agreed it doesn't affect the property, so we're not going to file this pendants. Okay, everybody good? And again, this happened in May of 14. Okay, everybody good there? All right. So uh, so that is going, let me see if there was a, a question. Hold on a second. Lena, uh, you haven't updated the question. Um, and uh, Lena, I apologize if I'm just not reading it right. How do you think tax lien investment versus the actual property investment? I'm not sure if I understand. Okay. So those are my end of my Schedule B exceptions. You can see there's a lot that can happen in that title report. I think reading a title report is, is, is very entertaining. Um, and, and so every transaction that I do, uh, every transaction that Linda's agents do, I'm reading the free lab, okay? All right, uh, it's going to happen. Um, some people invest in tax lien. Okay, you're talking about people buying the tax lien, um, and different states handle it differently. I know in Arizona, for example, um, if if there's a lien, on, a tax lien on on the property, and and you're not paying the taxes on it. You know, they have a five year burn where they can actually foreclose on the, the state can foreclose on the property. But at year number two, they sell their interest in the foreclosure to a third party. So I think that's what you're talking about. Um, of owning actual I don't know, some companies out there aggressive by promoting tax lien investment. Um, so uh, so I think what your question is, is that can you get involved with companies that purchase the tax lien from the county or from the state? Uh, and the answer is sure. Um, in most cases that I'm aware of, it doesn't come to fruition anyway. Um, you know, I, I've had owners who had tax liens and, and they get right up just prior to date of, of foreclosing by the county um, and they would pay it off. But by that point, you got a lot of penalties associated with it as well. But um, but you may not be able to recover that if you're an investor in those tax documents. So, OK, uh, anything else in here I need to cover? Questions for me so far? This is a lot of material. Um, uh, is it ethical or legal for the agent to do? Oh, I don't know. Uh, for the agent to do it, uh, that's, uh, you know, there's no law against it. You could do it. Would I recommend that a client do it? I probably wouldn't. They need to talk to a financial planner. Your question's a really good one. Um, a lot of times people come to you and they'll say, well, you know, um, is the market going to keep going up in value? And I always look at them and I go, I think the market is still going up. Um, it's just not going up crazy numbers that, that you know, remember, we were afraid of those numbers for a long period of time. But I think anytime they need to talk to financial planners, I've got some really good ones, um, you know, uh, and I refer them out all the time because I always tell people, you know, I do trial work as an expert on market conditions, but my crystal ball is, is you know, the batteries are low. And so I really don't know what to tell them about um, whether, you know, real estate's a good investment for them or not. I think real estate's always a good investment. I think when I look at my 10-year plan, I think I always see I'm making money every every 10 years, okay? So, um, it's you know, 10 years from now, I'm still holding it. Now, that doesn't guarantee the flipper is always going to be making money, but, but I can tell you that as a general rule, um, most people make money by owning real estate. Okay. All right. Um, so my requirements section, company will require the following documentation. So I told you about this earlier. You knew this was coming. So what? We need to know who this LLC is, right? And so they're going to require, and this says it right in the prelim, um, prior to issuance of any title assurance, 
uh, uh, predicated on the conveyance or encumbrance, we want to know that the seller is the seller. So a copy of the operating agreement. Again, I've highlighted this for you. These are my highlights, not theirs. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. If it's, the, if it's a domestic limited liability, so in other words, a California corporation. So we we have a California corporation for doing real estate. It's an S ch chapter S, um, uh, S corp, we call it. Um, it is a domestic um uh, it's not an LLC, it's a court. But but when we go to do business in other states where we are also doing business, um, we actually are a foreign corporation in those states. So for purposes of California, we're going to talk about, there's my warning that says I'm running out of time. So in California, if I'm a corporation in California licensed to do business here, then I'm a domestic. And so at that point, they're going to want a copy of the articles of organization and all the amendments and filing stamps and all that kind of stuff. So like I said, have your seller go look it up now. You know, no, don't be waiting until an offer comes in. That's going to be, you know, now you're going to hold things up because you've got an obligation to give this to the buyer, at least the signing authority within three days, and then title's going to need it. And how do you know your buyer's not going to come in and say, I want to close on Friday? You know, then you're going to be, you know, running around. So if the LLC is member managed, then a full list of all the members. Um, if the LLC is formed in a foreign jurisdiction, again, my foreign corporation, evidence satisfactory, blah, 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 it's in good standing and authorized to do business in the state of origin, okay? Um, and then again, for my member managed, if less than all the members of managers uh, will be executed documents to furnish evidence of the authority of those signings. So remember what I said earlier about the and trust versus the or trust? So if I've got, um, and and some uh, some trusts require two, three, and four signatures. So on a trust cert, we call it, There's always it's always at least one page, sometimes two. I, I've never seen three, but all right. Um, it's usually a, a condensed document Again, title is going to look from all of it, not just that, okay? But they are definitely going to see that need to see that. And that's what you need to get from your clients. So for a trust, you need to trust cert. It's usually just a couple of pages at the most. Um, if it's a corporation, you need to know who the statutory agent is, who's the agent for service of process, things like that. All of these people, we're looking for who has signing authority, people that have the authority to sign on behalf of the entity in which they are claiming to represent, okay? All right, so um, give them all that. Uh, here we go. Uh, evidence of authority of those signing. Um, and then we have the the title has the right, the company title has the right to uh, add additional items. And that can happen anytime up until closing. And so where you've got the buyer, we I, I have one right now where the buyer is a, a, a trust. And and we know that the um that uh but the but the cash is coming from another trust, uh, and then and that other trust, by the way, uh, is uh, under indictment for federal land scheme charges. Well, I'm just using this as an example. So if I know that's where the money comes from, is coming from, what are my obligations as the agent to represent the buyer who is you know going to be getting the money from that place? I don't know. You need to be talked to counsel about that, okay? But can title, you know, you know, so when you lie, uh, you know, the buyer lies, title's going to find out about it anyway, regardless, right? At some point, okay? And so you may disgorge the entire thing. Otherwise, this is just an exercise in futility. It's a lot like when you pull up to a stop sign, you know, so the law says, some people believe that there's no law unless there's a police officer there. Well, I, listen, I stop at stop signs. There's some people that just like to live life dangerously and, and roll through the stop sign, looking, of course, both ways to make sure there's no law enforcement there, which I think, remember, the purpose behind the stop sign is to protect lives um, and to create some sense of order. Um, and so same thing applies here. These rules are here to uh, to establish some sense of order so that we don't have um, you know uh, people get hurt. Um, so that's why I say I stop at the stop sign. I don't need to look around for law enforcement. They're, they're there. They're not there. I don't care. I stop. Right. But for, for those of us who like to live dangerously and roll through these things. And so I've had some of the most hysterical conversations with law enforcement about the perception of what is a complete stop, by the way. You know, anyway, I won't get into that. So uh, operating agreement amendments are required in order to verify those who can execute documents on behalf of the, of the parties. OK, so any rights of the parties in possession not disclosed by public record. Again, what am I looking at here? I'm looking at my requirements section. So 
So again, I may have tenants, I may have things like that. And I put that just down here because tenants have a right of possession and most leases are not recorded. Copies are required of any unrecorded lease that may affect the property. <clears throat> so again, it, we're thinking mostly in commercial, but I'm going to tell you in residential, you may have, I, I, don't, I don't know a lot of title companies that require it in residential, but in commercial, for sure, we're going to need to be doing that because they have a, a right that usually exceeds a year. OK, all right. Uh, let's see what else. Um, statement of information. So who do we want? To, it used to be in the old days. We wanted it from the buyer to make sure they didn't have any you know, trailing liens or anything like that. Now they just want it from everybody. OK, so they want ask. They want uh, I'm sorry, the buyers to prove that they are who they say they are. They're going to give. And you, by the way, do not fill out that statement of information. Sometimes it's called statement of identity. You'll hear it called SI, but you do not fill that out on behalf of the parties, okay, please, all right? But they're going to require it from the buyer. They're going to require it from the seller uh, for a lot of the same reasons, but some of them are different reasons. Again, they want to make sure they're going to look them up. They want SS numbers, which you don't want in your file, right? Uh, SS numbers, other proof, you know, things like that. And they're going to look the parties up to just make sure they've got the right party. So if your party, you know, more so if your party has a common name, right, uh, then then they need to do a little bit more digging, but uh, normally um, they want to make sure that that there there aren't any surprises out there. I guess that's the easiest way to put it. Okay. Any questions about any of that? And then uh, informational notes section. I mean, this is uh, I I think you should read this. Okay. So um, describes the lenders needs and all that. There's a lot of really good stuff in here. I tried to highlight it. Wouldn't let me highlight it because of the way they put it in here, but. Um, but for example, uh, number one, um, due to the conflict between federal and state laws concerning cultivation, distribution, manufacture, or sale of marijuana, the company is not able to close or insure any transaction involving land that is associated with these activities. Oh, my gosh. And, and guess what? It's becoming more and more common, right? So for the attorneys and the lawyers in the in the group here, you know, we know what that means, right? And people are doing this kind of thing. And, and so, uh, you know, how are you going to insure against that when the title company is going to say, no, it's just a matter of principle. We're not going to insure against it. So <laughs> so these are good things for you to read. Um uh, and again, we don't have time to go over all. I knew we were going to run out of time. Wire fraud alert. I, I highlighted this. Um, it still happens today. I mean, I know it's going to come up tomorrow at risk management again. Um, I've got really good FBI uh, PowerPoints on the subject. Send me an email. I'll send those to you. Um, but it has become a huge part of our industry. And despite the fact that we have this, I have it in my signature line. Escrow sends out a thing. We're going to call you to confirm. Do not send money until we do so. All of that. And yet still we have uh, wire fraud. OK. And again, here's the cool part about wire fraud. If you commit wire fraud, that means the, the uh, inspector general, the postmaster inspector, a postal inspector, by the way, they're they're more hardcore than FBI. OK. Those people are really hardcore. Uh, so Anytime money moves across state lines, you've got the postmaster, uh, the, the postal inspector involved. And uh, and that's what I've seen some people do serious <laughs> uh, time uh, um, anyway uh, for violating those things. So just be aware of that. Uh, of course, none of you here would be considering a criminal act like that. But but anytime it goes across state lines. I mean, like, for example, there really is no loan fraud, um, but it's wire fraud. <laughs> so. Uh, Anyway, that's what they get you with. Okay, what else? Anything else in there I want to talk to you about? Uh, privacy notice, of course, we all have that. Oh, there is one other thing in here. Hang on a second. I do want to show you. Uh, notice of available discounts. So the California discount notice. So, you know, from time to time, and the argument is that every title company takes its turn in the in the in the violations in California, you know, there's going to be a, a, a settlement. Um, and so this tells you that you've got a certain amount of time to apply for those settlements, things like that. Um uh, pre-printed policies, excuse me. I mean, nobody ever reads this. You need it, you know, they, they only read it after they get burned by it. So then, of course, you know, everybody's talking to lawyers, but, you know, I don't have any problem with that at all. I want them talking to lawyers. Uh, here's my uh, um, percentage of my deductibles on my policies. All this is included in all these reports. Um, and um, I think that's, uh, oh, here we go, plat map. Okay, so plat map, how do I read a plat map? Well, and, and again, nobody tells you this, but look at this. This gives you really identifiable points for you to be looking for. Um, if I go down here to the legend, I can see each of those is actually called out. So, you know, I'm usually going to have my parcel number, um, but I'm going to be looking for my page and block and all that. You can pretty much 
affirm that this is going to be, the property is going to be somewhere on here. The way you find it is based on what the parcel number says. Okay. All right. Uh, other questions. The rest of this is just notes. Um, so there's really nothing in there other than you taking notes of my talk, which I'm assuming you've been doing. Um, and that's all I got. Uh, okay. So again, thank you to Fidelity for providing that. Um, I've got the common forms of vesting title. I'll send you all that. Oh, a tax bill. Um, so I want you to take a look at this tax bill. God, I thought for sure we were done. Uh, so I want you to take, this is an older tax bill, so it probably doesn't even apply anymore. But I do want to uh, tell you that um, here's my land improvements, my exemptions, stuff like that. But when I get down here, let me see if I can um, increase this by just a little bit. Uh because I want to show you something. Nobody's going to tell you about this, right? But but when I get down in here and I see the your tax distribution, I see voter-approved bonds, I see uh, uh, mosquito surveillance, things like that. When people tell me that the property doesn't have any assessments against it, I, I challenge them to prove it. I get my Poway Unified CFD, my my Community Facilities District, um, that's my Mellow Roos. It's almost always the larger, uh, usually the second largest of the taxes. Um, I'm sorry, it's not a tax. It's Mellow Roos, right? It's a it's a it's a dodge of Prop 13, right? So so the um, I'm not saying it's not a legitimate charge. I mean they they literally have you know not enough money to cover the bills, pay for lighting, police protection, fire, schools, thing. You know, so Mellow Roos is not just schools. It's all this other stuff. So but you, you when you're buying is told that there's no um, assessments, it's highly unlikely to be true. So I've got my vector disease control. That's my rodents, right? I've got my, uh, the hero program, if, if you uh, it involved in that bonding. Uh, uh, Tory Highlands uh, maintenance project, the metropolitan water standby charge. Um, again, here's my Poway Unified uh CFD for number 10, okay, going to be more than one. Poway's got really good schools, and you see somebody's got to pay for that. Uh, and then the California Water Authority, water availability. Everybody's got their hands in this. So here's my tax is $17,000. Uh, that's my tax distribution. So $17,000. Does everybody understand that? So so look at this. You should get this from your title uh, company. But now uh, most of the natural hazard disclosure companies are providing these as well because they for sure uh, also put in the Melaroo. OK, so just be aware of that. I'll send all this to you. Um, uh, good breakdown. So uh, I'm going to go ahead. Uh, no other qu uh, question. Uh, batteries are low, right? <laughs> yeah, my crystal ball, the batteries are low. I, I stopped predicting the future a long time ago. I can tell you what's happened and I can tell you my best guess is what could happen, but it's never, never not necessarily ever going to happen. So anyway, any other questions about anything we covered today? That was a lot of material. And I do appreciate, you know, I'm, I'm thinking here that two hours wasn't enough time, but I used to do this in an hour. And you can imagine, you think I talk fast in two hours, what do you see, three hours. So uh, anyway, uh, thank you. I, I thank you all for being here today. Uh, again, I am in uh, Sacramento at the uh, CAR legislative meetings. So um, so we'll have uh, uh, this afternoon at two o'clock, we'll have the uh, top 10 risk avoidance techniques. Uh, but then we're going to take a break until um, the uh, uh, take a break until uh, next Thursday. So uh, remember, folks, you know, have a written agreement between your seller and you have your written agreement between your buyer and you. When you define your duty, you limit your liability. Thank you for joining us. Um, if you uh, some I'm going to take this out of here. There's a lot for our education department is amazingly good. Um, not everything seems to get up there. So send me an email if you got anything you want to see. I'm happy to help you. Uh, let them know if you have any classes that you want to see. Um, yeah, and I thank you all for reaching out to education at SDR. They're wonderful people there. Um, and and so and and they they really San Diego Association of Realtors is all about education because education is the key to success. So. So uh, thank you to uh, that the department. It's not just a committee, it's a department. Um, uh, I do have a weekly email that goes out. Uh, I don't put anybody on it unless they ask to be on it. So send me an email, I'll put you on it. Uh, it contains direct links to each of my uh, classes so you don't have to go through all the other stuff. So uh, Kevin at Burke Real Estate Consultants.com. Um, if there aren't any other questions, um, um, send, send me an email. Don't put it in the chat. Send me an email. I'm happy to help you in any way that I can. Uh, and uh, again, as I say from my hometown of Del Mar, I look forward to seeing you around the track. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye for now.